Good afternoon. Will sergeants please start their recordings? PC recording has started. Uh, recording underway. Thank you. Backup is rolling. Thank you and good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair. We are ready to begin. I guess I'll get my gavel. Uh, thank you for joining our virtual hearing today before the Council's Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste. I would like to acknowledge my fellow members who are present. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Council Members Brannon, Council Member Chin, Council Member Gennaro, Council Member Kalos, Council Member Riley, and Council Member Rosenthal. I will now turn it over to the moderator uh, and our committee counsel, Nicole, um, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Sherry Nisso. I'm Nicole Levine, counsel to the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management, and I'll be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please so listen for your name to be called as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelist will be. We will first be hearing testimony from the administration, followed by testimony from the members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions of the administration or the specific panelists, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer questions. For members of the public, we will be limiting speaking time to three minutes in order to accommodate all who wish to speak today. Once you are called on to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any, when it is your turn to speak. Chair, would you like to give your opening statement before we swear in the administration? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Yes, uh, good afternoon. I am Council Member Antonio Reynoso. I'm the Chair of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. Thank you for attending this oversight hearing on getting to zero waste by 2030. We will also hear intro number 844, sponsored by Council Member Kalos to establish a goal of zero waste for New York City by 2030. Intro number 2250, which I am the sponsor of to mandate reporting on the progress toward sending zero waste to landfill. And intro 2103, sponsored by Council Member Rosenthal, requiring certain retail food stores to use the food donation web portal. My entire tenure in the council, I have chaired this committee and have spent the last seven years dedicated to delivering environmental justice, reducing our waste and increase, increasing recycling. Waste management is not sexy, but when done properly, it delivers significant harm. Uh, it delivers a significant uh, harm reduction by, uh, I'm sorry, it delivers significant harm by burdening communities of color with pollutants while contributing to climate change, the impacts of which could dwarf any crisis humanity has faced to date. Early on, when Mayor de Blasio announced his goal of sending zero waste to landfill by 2030, it seemed we had a ready partner in City Hall. However, following the announcement of the goal, it quickly became clear that there was no plan in place to achieve it. We have talked about the city's goals of getting to zero waste by 2030 for years now, but have made very little progress and there are real consequences to this lack of progress. In New York City, the same three black and brown communities continue to process a disproportionate amount of New York City's waste leading to high levels of respiratory illnesses and dangerous truck traffic. The waste then gets shipped to other states to landfills that incinerators, landfills and incinerators that also often sit within low-income communities of color. And I can assure you that they don't want our waste in their communities any more than we want it in ours. As waste rots in these landfills, it creates emissions that contribute to climate change. Plastics end up in our oceans and destroy our marine ecosystems. These impacts are just the tip of the iceberg of how waste impacts our environment in the short and long term. We simply cannot afford to stall any longer on making meaningful progress towards achieving zero waste. The mayor has created a significant credibility gap with the public by declaring that the climate crisis to, uh, by declaring the climate crisis to be the greatest calamity of our time and then immediately cutting environmental initiatives as soon as we hit a budget crunch. These programs are not amenities. 
but critical actions we must take if we have any hope of salvaging our planet and delivering environmental justice. I greatly appreciate the Department of Sanitation, and I know that they are working hard towards reducing waste, but the city needs to invest in recycling and reuse initiatives and ensure everyone has access to dispose of their waste properly. We need robust, culturally appropriate education and outreach to ensure New Yorkers are aware of and able to participate in these programs. The legislation that we are hearing today will codify the zero by 30 goal, mandate progress reports, plans and analysis so that the city can work towards actually increasing our diversion rates and significantly reducing the amount of waste we send to landfill. I look forward to hearing testimony from the SNY, environmental justice advocates and other interested groups about their experience with these initiatives so far and any advice that they have for how the city could be doing more to reduce waste. We have no time to waste. We need to take aggressive action to move our waste system towards a sustainable future. I will now turn it over to uh, Council Member Kalos, who would like to speak about his bill, and then Council Member Rosenthal to speak about her bill. Council Member Kalos. Thank you to Sanitation Chair Reynoso and former Progressive Caucus co chair. Uh, you have been fighting for our environment fighting zero waste uh, for as long as I can remember, even before you were in the city council. Uh, I wanna thank you for hearing this legislation to codify zero by 30 uh, last term and trying to get it done then under a previous speaker. I wanna thank you and Speaker Corey Johnson for prioritizing it this uh, today on the eve of Earth Day uh, for codifying the uh, zero by 30. And uh, I know, that uh, when the mayor said it, it was really good to hear because it meant we might have a willing partner and we don't have to argue about the values. The only issue is that by July 2020, the goal was to recycle 33% of department managed solid waste and 25% of curbside and containerized waste. And the city fell short of that goal in 2020 with an actual diversion rate of 21.6% of department managed solid waste and 18.5% of curbside and containerized waste. Uh, so we we are not we're not moving in the right direction even before the pandemic. When the pandemic hit, as you said, Chair, uh, it only made things worse, and we're seeing things going in the wrong direction with a reduction for composting and the types of reduction that we need to do. So um, I'm hoping that we can hear introduction 844 and uh, get it passed, get it done, along with your legislation, which I'm proud to co-sponsor, and uh, let's save the planet one one piece of trash at a time. Thank you, Council Member Kalo. So I will now call on our Council Member Helen Rosenthal. Can we unmute Council Member Rosenthal? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the unmute. And thank you, Council Member Reynoso, Chair of the Committee on Sanitation um, for being an exemplar chair, um, but for ho also holding this incredibly important hearing um, today and for including my legislation. And I want to acknowledge my colleague, former council member, uh, Rafael Espinal, who first introduced this bill. Intro 2103 is intended to strengthen the food donation system for larger food retail stores. My bill is a meaningful step forward to reduce the enormous amount of food we wastefully send to landfills every day and supporting the institutions that feed hungry New Yorkers. We're living at a time when food insecurity and hunger are rising and the need for food banks and other resources continues to increase. The human and environmental impacts of trucking thousands of tons of edible food to landfills across the region are unacceptable. So instead of throwing out edible food, we are finding ways to get it to hungry people whether through partnerships with nonprofits and community-based organizations or via the city's food portal. Grocery stores that already have food donation plans with organizations like City Harvest, for example, would be exempt. And because we have no intention of burdening our bodegas and small retailers, there is a minimum size requirement for stores covered by the law. 
there's absolutely room for improvement in this legislation and we welcome everyone's feedback today. Thank you again, Chair Reynoso, for leading the way as we chart a path for zero waste to landfills. Shouldn't be as hard as people make it out to be. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal, for that. And um, now I think I'll pass it over to our committee council being um, to uh, swear in our guests. Thank you. Uh, we will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. Appearing today for the Department of Sanitation will be DSNY Commissioner Edward Grayson, Deputy Commissioner for Recycling and Sustainability Bridget Anderson, and Deputy Commissioner for Policy and External Affairs Gregory Anderson. At this time, I will administer the oath to each representative of the administration. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee today, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Edward Grayson? I do. Deputy Commissioner Bridget Anderson? I do. Sorry, can you say that again? You didn't pop up on the screen. I do. Thank you. And Deputy Commissioner Gregory Anderson? I do. Thank you. You may begin your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair Reynoso and members of the City Council Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. I'm Edward Grayson, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Sanitation, and I am joined today by Bridget Anderson, our Deputy Commissioner for Recycling and Sustainability, and Gregory Anderson, our Deputy Commissioner for Policy and External Affairs. And we thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon on the important subject of zero waste and the three bills under consideration today. It is especially appropriate to recognize that tomorrow, April 22nd, we celebrate the 51st anniversary of Earth Day, a time when people, groups, and cities across our nation and the globe come together to raise awareness and inspire action on sustainability and climate change. Achieving zero waste to landfills is a key part of the city's efforts to fight climate change and improve our environment. I also wanna take a moment here to reflect on where we were last year at this time and where we are today. One year ago, we were facing some of the most painful budget cuts in city history. To ensure we could continue core government operations and to devote resources to essential safety, health, shelter, and food security needs. As an unfortunate consequence, we were forced to hit the pause button on other department programs, including deep cuts to some of our beloved zero waste programs. For me personally, this was difficult because I've spent much of my career over the last decade leading the operational implementation of many of these programs. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, we were making steady progress towards our goals, increasing diversion rates and expanding access to a growing suite of programs. Unfortunately, the pandemic has halted some of that progress. And while MGP and paper collection tonnage is up, refuse tonnage is also up in most districts and waste generation patterns have shifted as a result of the economic toll of the crisis. As the city continues to recover, we're likely to see a shift again in a new and evolving waste generation pattern. DSNY has never stopped planning for the future, despite these circumstances. The department is committed to moving ahead to rebuild and reinvest in these important programs and redouble our efforts to fight the climate crisis. Reducing greenhouse gas emissions from solid waste involves reducing the volume of waste generated collecting food waste, the largest source of waste-related GHG emissions, to make compost energy, and increasing reuse and recycling of the remaining materials. To achieve zero waste, the department will implement large-scale changes to some of its current programs while implementing new, improved, and expanded programs that target recyclables, organics, textiles, electronics, household items, and other non-recyclable waste. Organic waste, including food scraps and yard waste is one of the most significant contributors of waste related greenhouse gas emissions and is also the largest category of New York's waste stream. This material makes up one third of the current waste stream and represents a significant opportunity to reduce emissions from landfill waste by diverting the material for beneficial methods, including composting and anaerobic digestion. And in the case of specifically of food to minimize it at its source. The suspension of curbside composting last year was very difficult for us. 
We invested a lot of time and energy into that program over the last several years, and it is a very important part of achieving our zero waste goals. I'm pleased that the preliminary FY22 budget includes $3.5 million for the New York City Compost Project to continue operating food scrap drop-off sites across the city and support community composting. These drop-off sites have been extremely popular, breaking participation records over the last several months. We also offer resources to support those who are able to compost at home, both through the department's website and through the New York City Compost Project partnerships. As the city continues to recover, we look forward to the further restoring and expanding our composting programs in the future. Another example of DSNY's community-based approach to zero waste is Donate NYC, which helps New Yorkers give goods, find goods, and do good. By donating and reusing goods instead of discarding them, New Yorkers can greatly reduce waste, conserve energy and resources, save money, and help provide jobs and human services for New Yorkers in need. Donate NYC also provides vital support for New York City's reuse community, helping nonprofit organizations and local reuse businesses increase and promote their reuse efforts. The preliminary FY22 budget also provides funding for the department to reinstate its special and hazardous waste collection programs. We expect that the special waste drop-off sites uh, to reopen in July with the same schedule as in prior years, which was every Saturday and the last Friday of each month. We are also planning for safe disposal events in each borough this fall. These drop-off events provide for the collection of household hazardous waste. We also thank the council for enacting legislation to reduce or eliminate hard to dispose of items. Imposing the five cent fee on paper carryout bags at stores has helped reduce single use plastic bag waste by encouraging New Yorkers to bring their own reusable bags. We have also distributed more than 1 million reusable bags to New Yorkers since 2016. And through February, the paper bag fee has generated more than 840,000 in revenue for New York City to support these efforts. The city's phone ban, which took effect in January of 2019, prohibits businesses from using, offering, or selling single-use foam service products and loose fill packaging material. It has also contributed to the reduction in foam product waste. There is no denying that our goal of sending zero waste to landfills by 2030 was ambitious from the start. We set the bar very high. And unfortunately, some policy changes needed to make this happen are not within the city's control and the state government also plays a key role in waste policy. The department has been actively engaged in efforts at the state level to enact extended producer responsibility programs for paper and plastic packaging. EPR requires the manufacturers and retailers of products to be financially responsible for the recycling or disposal of, the pro of their products. EPR for packaging and paper has the potential to support the funding of outreach for recycling infrastructure investments and to reimburse the city for at least a portion of recycling costs. It has the potential to reduce the city taxpayer burden of recycling by tens of millions of dollars. There are city and state EPR programs already in place for electronics, mercury thermostats, rechargeable batteries, and refrigerant containing products. And soon the state will implement programs covering paint and pharmaceuticals. Sharing the cost of sustainable materials management with the producers is an important tool to help the city advance its sustainability goals. Achieving zero waste and shifting to a thriving circular economy depends on high recycling rates. While recycling rates have been improving, thanks in part to the department's outreach efforts, the, still, the city still has a long way to go. Best practices around the world have demonstrated the success of a combination of outreach, financial incentives, an infrastructure that allows recycling to be simple, easy, and convenient. Given our dense built environment, diverse neighborhoods, and older building stock, this change can be difficult, but we will continue to challenge ourselves to improve and do better. I will now turn to the three bills that we're here to discuss today. The first bill, intro 844, would require the department to establish a goal of diverting 100% of city generated waste by 2030. If the department determines that such a goal is not feasible, despite best efforts, the department must report such finding and make recommendations for actions that it may undertake to achieve such diversion within 180 days of such a determination. 
The second bill, in true 2250, would require the department to submit to the mayor and council speaker on or by July 1st of 2021, a plan to send zero waste to landfills by 2030 with annual progress reports beginning July, 2022. The last bill, intro 2103, would require large retail food stores to post notices on the department's food donation portal of excess food that they have available for donation at least once per month except for those stores that already have agreements in place to donate their excess food to not-for-profit organizations. Retail stores would be required to arrange for transportation of the excess food with reasonable effort if requested by the recipient. I wanna thank Chair Reynoso and the sponsors of these bills for introducing them and for convening this important conversation today. The department supports the spirit of all three bills. Nevertheless, I have concerns about the timeline of the zero waste goal and the reporting requirements set forth on the intros 844 and 2250. Our learnings from past efforts combined with the setbacks that were caused by the COVID-19 pandemic show that we need to take an all in approach to zero waste, including a combination of new policies, programs, legislative reforms, and partnerships with the private sector. While we will work aggressively to make progress as quickly as possible, the setbacks of COVID have made it difficult to predict the timeline of achieving this goal. As to the reporting requirements proposed on the intro 2250, the department already publishes detailed monthly diversion and disposal statistics for curbside collection programs by district and borough. Additionally, the department pub publishes annual reports covering the department programs, including curbside collection, as well as non-curbside programs for e-waste, textiles, used goods, and special waste. These were reports are required on the various local laws passed over the past several decades. They are posted on the department's website and are publicly accessible. The reporting requirements set forth in intro 2250 as written would be duplicative with the existing required reports. But we look forward to working and having further discussions with the council to discuss the changes to these reporting requirements that achieve our mutual goals of transparency and accountability. As to intro 2103, the department created a food donation portal pursuant to local law 176 of 2017, which matches prospective donors and recipients based on availability of excess food. We are pleased that the council would like to expand the use of this program, and we support the goal of encouraging food retailers to safely donate excess food to organizations who help feed the hungry New Yorkers. However, I would like to hear more from the retail food industry and others who have joined us today to better understand the impact of the legislation on their daily operations, their current food donation efforts, and their ability to meet the bill's requirements. As a department works to support the city's recovery for all, we remain committed to our zero waste goals. We will continue to work with the communities, stakeholders, and this council to develop, to develop, expand, and deepen our programs in support of these goals. I thank you for your time, and we are now happy to answer questions. Thank you, <clears throat> Commissioner Grayson. Um, Commissioner, I, I know that uh, you believe, you know, achieving this goal by 2030 will be a difficult one. Um, and it was a difficult one when we set the goal out over six years ago. Um, and I know that you also mentioned the fact that a lot of these goals are difficult to accomplish because some of them are state driven. Um, but I wanna focus on what the city could have or could do that they're not doing um, in an effort to show the lack of uh, priority that the mayor has set on a goal that I think he used more as a catchphrase or use more as a, uh, you know, a line that sounds really good, but never had the intention to actually see it through. Um, and I wanna be very clear that this is not a reflection of the department's work and more uh, a lack of political will from the administration. Uh, there is, has there been a study done on uh, the Save As You Throw program that would reduce uh, waste in the city of New York? Um, in the work that we've seen, a significant portion of our reduction efforts would come through a Save As You Throw program. Has the administration moved forward with any study or any work um, related to the Save As You Throw program? Thank you for your question, Chair. Um, we have, uh, you know, internally, we have a dedicated team 
uh, of people who are staying with all the trends and uh, know what other municipalities are doing, uh, weigh the pros and cons of uh, you know, pay as you throw or save as you throw programs. And we remain committed to having that knowledge base and recognizing that that is definitely a tool uh, that has helped many municipalities and, and many communities uh, help you know, have a thriving recycling program. Um, I will let our Deputy Commissioner Bridget Anderson uh, talk deeply about what we know of pay as you throw and save as you throw programs uh, and, and what we've learned. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Chairman Osa, for that question. Uh, we did have a um, million dollar budget in the very early days of the 1MIC program to um, commission a study about savings as you throw. And uh, unfortunately, that um, budget uh, was removed, and so we were not able to commission a formal study. However, as Commissioner Gration mentioned, we do track and follow the trends with save as you throw, pay as you throw programs. Uh, New York City being the largest, densest city in the country, majority uh, renters, home homeowners are, are folks are renters. Uh, the high multi-unit um, density of the of the city it makes it difficult to understand exactly what we we understand that there will be benefits to a save as you throw program. Most cities that do it find that it it does trigger incentives around. Um, uh, diversion. Um, however, to what extent those triggers will happen uh, in New York City, in the rental units, etc., we do not have a clear understanding. Um, but we do think that it is still an important task to um, continue to study safe as youth programs and figure out exactly how it could work in New York City. Um, I will also say that in the commercial sector, pay as you throw, save as you throw is also an important um, part. And with the transition of the commercial waste sector to commercial waste zones, we do have an opportunity to actually create differential pricing for recycling, composting, and trash. And so that will, we do anticipate that that is actually going to be a tool that we'll be able to use in the commercial sector. Deputy Commissioner, but are, are you saying that uh, in other cities, the Save as You Throw model has been an, a crucial component of reducing waste? or Commissioner Grayson, anyone? My, my point here is simple. I, I get that you're doing research, but I, if I asked right now, if we pass legislation today that we would implement Save As You Throw, would the city be prepared to, to move forward with that? Or would they have to do a study um, before they can move forward with that? And why not have the study already done so that we could be in a position, should we want to implement it, um, to be ready to go? Um, and, and again, this would be a very easy way to show us in the advocacy world um, in the activist world and in the council world that you're serious about getting zero waste. <clears throat> and I guess I that's we, the, that should be, yeah. and, and, and this is tough for me to do, Bridget, because I know how dedicated you are to achieving these goals um, and would want to be very clear that I think a lot of this comes from the top. And it's, it's unfortunate that we're going to grow the Department of Sanitation, who's probably uh, the most... Uh, wanting or a group that wants to get this done, but um, save as you throw is a crucial component of getting to zero waste and you guys have done very little um, to move forward with uh, implementing it. We feel as though we are prepared when, when we're given the opportunity to co commission a study, we're prepared to advance that study quickly given all of the background research that we've been doing in a house. Um, a study is important for us to be able to figure out what exactly the steps we'd need to take to make it happen in New York City. So why not put a million dollars back into the budget to study Save As You Throw? It's a very simple, straightforward question. It's something we're willing to work with you and the administration to determine um, what's feasible. Okay, so that's one thing that the city can control that the state is not involved in that would speak volumes as to the commitment from the Department of Sanitation in its goals to achieve zero waste. Uh, the recycling of textiles and electronic waste, also a program that has been shut down by the city of New York during COVID. Um, is there uh, an attempt here to re reinstate that program in fully uh, um, now at this budget, Commissioner Grayson? Uh, as it stands, thank you, Chair. Um, as it stands, uh, the electronic waste program uh, that we had been implementing and, and was a, a very good program. 
Uh, as of this hearing, uh, there is no plan to reinstate the program in FY22. Uh, and we continue to work you know, uh, with the administration, with OMB on uh, seeing where restorations are going to come in on some of our, our most cherished programs. Um, we have, you know, we have been doing what we can and trying to promote, uh, you know, awareness, you know, with digital messaging and trying to, to, you know, let all the residents know what they still can do, you know, to be a part of the recycling community, to recycle textiles and do what they can with the, you know, retailers that are required to take back. Uh, it's not a convenient program on e-waste for New York City residents. We recognize that. And again, as of this, this the short answer is uh, the e-waste will not be coming back as of this hearing date. And we're still working on uh, finding out exactly what happens on restorations uh, moving ahead. So it's safe to say that the city has quit uh, on getting to zero waste by 2030. Do we have another year that you want to anticipate that we would get to zero waste? Is the city committing to zero waste by 2040? Is it committing to zero waste by 2050? I would like to know what the new commitment from the city is. I think that that is a more than fair question, sir. Um, and uh, it has been an absolute pleasure working with you in your capacity as chair uh, in my various roles over the last few years with the department. And I can tell you that the department and the city is committed to zero waste. And I think that putting a new calendar date on it is going to be very difficult. Um, but I can assure you that, and you said it in your opening commentary, uh, we are committed to being all in on zero waste goals. I find that putting a date on it uh, is going to be extremely difficult because of the confluence of factors that are involved in getting there. Um, and I look forward to working on a new timeline, uh, working on the timeline on what it could be with you and your colleagues and the rest of the council. Uh, Commissioner Grayson, would, would you have advised the mayor to maybe not say that we would get to zero waste by 2030? Um, uh, even without COVID, uh, it seemed to many of us in this, in this room that 2030 was ambitious and just took a couple of years for us to know that it was something that couldn't happen. Um, why set a goal so aggressively and then not follow up with a, a strong plan? I think the, the issue we have here is that there is no plan if you want to get something done, if you want to build a house, you have a blueprint, if you have an architect, like you put things together. This city just says something and what we assume that we're going to achieve that goal, um, you know, because everything is going to come together on its own. We have to work towards a plan. And I just don't feel like right now, even Commissioner Grayson, that you can outline a plan that again is there by 2050. Um, just because I don't think this administration has made it a priority in your agency to actually achieve this goal. I think it's again, it was just a, a line used to look good um, and achieve and not necessarily achieve the goal. Um, it, it speaks to the same thing with Vision Zero. Just this uh, seems to be a pattern in this administration of making commitments and not being able to achieve them. And I think it comes from a lack of planning. It's just, uh, and DSNY, I think is the most, uh, one of the most managerially efficient uh, agencies that exist in the city of New York. And it not being able to put forth a plan to help us achieve zero waste is a big problem to me and to many communities that suffer through environmental injustices and so forth that this plan is supposed to help save. So um, I guess in, instead of a, of a, of a question, because I want to move on and allow for my colleagues and for all these advocates to speak on this issue, is just you forced our hand. Um, and, and not you, Commissioner Grayson. I want to keep saying, making clear here, uh, the administration, Mayor Bill de Blasio, has forced the city council to have to pass legislation to make it mandatory for you to achieve a goal that you set, right? We're, we're making it mandatory that you achieve a goal that you set um, and also to have a plan so that we can see that the cho that the, the goal can actually be achieved. That, that's what we're going to be doing. We're gonna help you help yourself by mandating that we meet a goal and that we have a plan to achieve that goal. Um, and, and it's an unfortunate thing that we got here because everyone in this room wanted to be an ally with this administration in its attempt to achieve zero waste by 2030. And it's just, we've been, we've been met with failure at every step, a lack of commitment. The first cuts, the largest cuts 
this administration made during COVID work to the Department of Sanitation. There's just no commitment from the administration when it comes to this department. And I, and I think, um, you know, everyone here is over it and looking to do something more meaningful so we can achieve this important goal. So uh, Commissioner Grayson, I wanna uh, relieve you of having to answer these questions because I really don't think that this is a Department of Sanitation problem. I think this is an administration problem. Um, and, you know, to see, you know, both Bridget and Gregory Anderson here, um, you know, it pains me because I know the values of this administration and its, uh, and its folks, its policy folks. So I wanna move forward and allow for my colleagues. I have more questions, a lot more questions that I will ask after the next, after my colleagues go, but I wanna make sure that they have time here um, to ask questions. And I wanna start with um, council member Helen Rosenthal, who is a sponsor of one of the bills, uh, council member Rosenthal. And I, I'm so sorry, this will be the last time I'm calling on folks. Uh, the committee council will handle that um, in order of when you raised your hand. Um, so uh, council member Rosenthal first, and then we'll move from there. Thank you so much, Chair Reynoso. Um, and thank you to Sanitation for being here and testifying. Um, I'm anxious to actually turn it back over to Council Member Reynoso because he's asking, uh, you know, all the questions that, um, and, and demanding all of the work that Sanitation needs to do in order for us to get to zero waste which is a common goal. And, you know, he, his, I share his frustration. I'm actually, you know, I uh, appreciated your co comment, Commissioner, about wanting to hear from the uh, grocery store association industry um, before commenting on, on my bill. Um, and I eagerly await hearing from them as well. Um, but it sounds like should should that not be a problem, there is a mechanism that's already, you know, on the sanitation website that could be used. Is that right? Uh, that is correct. Great, great, great. And that would be, if everyone is kosher with this bill, that would be easy enough to do or, or then we would have an implementation problem? Like? I think, uh, fair enough question, I think that, uh, while we have a mechanism, I think that we would have to just do some smoothing. Um, and our main goal is to make sure uh, as we work with you and we see the progression of the bill and hear the commentary, just make sure that what the, while we completely support the spirit, as I said, of the bill and making sure that we can do what we can to eliminate food waste and make sure that people who uh, you know, are in jeopardy of being food insecure can have this. It's a perfect marriage. There's a there is also some local level already deals. We just want to make sure that none of the good work that's already going on gets impacted. Uh, and then we want to definitely be part of a partnership that helps it be the best it possibly can be. So yeah. You know, interestingly, um, it's happening organically in my community. There's a local church um, that has connected with local restaurants and grocery stores that are delivering food to the church at the end of the day. Um, and it's been incredibly um, helpful to, to those who need the food. Um, and, and that's what gives me confidence that I think we're going to be able to get there. Um, uh, on a different matter, and then Chair, I promise to pass it back to you and the other colleagues, I, could I learn a little bit more about digesters, which you spoke about? Oh, I don't know if you spoke about it or, or one of your colleagues um, mentioned it in, in our earlier press conference. But, um, you know, I had been asking sanitation uh, in the first year of my being in this position to get an anaerobic digester put in right next to the sanitation site on the on West 59th Street um, and the Hudson River. It seemed like it was a place that where there was an anchor, um, sort of, and it it wouldn't be so hard to um, get one there. But there seemed to be hurdles that were insurmountable. Um, to do something like that. 
it, do those hurdles still exist or is this something where I can request of the commissioner that we invest in a digester right at that location? Uh, great question. But like anything uh, having to do with construction and infrastructure, uh, yes, hurdles are still in place. Um, but I definitely look forward to, and this agency stays committed to working with you and council on uh, what would be one of the ways that, that the department definitely needs to uh, look at moving forward uh, as part of a comprehensive zero waste plan is, is anaerobic digesters and placement of them and partnership agreements and, and an increased network where we can do this good work with, with waste and digestion and that being a mechanism of how we handle it. So currently it is not something we could just flip a switch with. Uh, so it's, I don't know that all of the same hurdles, but there are still hurdles. And we definitely look forward to continuing that conversation with you and, and continuing on a global scale with this committee on what will be the long-term plan uh, that definitely includes lo some level of digestion. Do you have um, a map? Is there a map somewhere of where the digesters are now? Uh, we can provide offline the, the digestive spots um, that are available um, and what would, you know, you know, because not all of it is, is, is mass scale, but we can definitely provide you with some information on where some of those operations are if you would like to see something. A hundred percent. And so let's start with that, which would be the easy thing if uh, committee council could share that information with me when it comes over from sanitation. And if you could send that over right away, so don't let my next question slow that down. But I would like to see whether or not uh, there would be an opportunity for one at the West 59th Street site, which just seems opportune um, right now. Yeah, and, and council member, I would add, um, I, I remember uh, the meeting that we had with the former commissioner, where you where you raised that as an idea, um, it was it was quite a few years ago, um, and uh, you know I think we did we did look at it. Obviously, that facility is a critical part of our paper collection and recycling uh, network. It handles all the paper for the island of Manhattan, which is a pretty significant um, amount of paper. I wouldn't want to change any of that. Yeah, so I think you know at the time we did look at it, and there there are some pretty severe space constraints. Um, we're happy to take another look at it, but I, I do think that you are um, raising an important issue, which is that, um, you know, as we look to reestablish um, our organics program and grow our organics program, currently food scrap drop-off sites um, in the future, um, hopefully sometime in the next, uh, next few years, you know, reestablishing curbside collection of organics, we really do need to have a processing infrastructure in place um, to handle that. We're making upgrades right now at our Staten Island compost facility to be able to handle more uh, food waste in addition to yard waste at that location. We're always in conversation with DEP about um, expanding the amount of food waste we handle at their anaerobic digestion facilities currently at Newtown Creek. We're looking at some of their other anaerobic digesters uh, for potential um, co-digestion. So I think yeah. I think definitely I a lot of opportunity there. I a bit narcissistic. I just wanted to talk about my district. I understand. Um, but I'm glad you're doing things across the city. I guess I'm going to push one more time and say, I know there's no space on the structure that there's now. And that's not the question I was asking. The question I'm asking is, as money has flowed in for Hudson River Park that's there, there's a private developer that is developing a new funky, you know, something, something off the um, sort of on the west side uh, pier. Why can't, why isn't, can't we be, what is the cost of setting up something on a pier right next to the current site? utilizing the amazing um, transit um, path that already exists for the paper recycling um, in a location that is not, you know, so heavily used by residents 
right now. You know, I'm really, I hope that the administration will think harder about what is getting in the way of building one there. And if it's money, you know, that's, that's why we have council members ability to put money in the budget, you know, and I've never gotten a request from sanitation to move forward on that, unfortunately. All right, thank you. Thank you so much to Reynoso and, and thank you to sanitation. Really appreciate your hard work. Thank you, council member Rosenthal. I think the sergeants are gonna take it away now. Um, well, actually next we'll hear from council member Chen. Beautiful, thank you, council member Chen. Time begins. I think she's on mute. Yeah, I'm trying to unmute. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Commissioner Grayson. It's great to see you again. Um, in your testimony, yeah, we're, we're happy that some money has been restored. Um, but as you know, it's not enough. And we're going to have to fight for more. Um, in your testimony, you talked about um, the reusable bag, the, the plastic bag. Uh, ban that came into effect finally. And you said that there was $840,000 that was generated. Do you have a time period for that? For the paper bag uh, fee? I, I believe that is uh, from implementation to, um, I'll just double check. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Greg Anderson, what was the date of that figure? Uh, yeah, so that's through, that's, it uh, was implemented last March, uh, 2020. That's through uh, the receipts in February. So we get uh, quarterly payments from the state uh, Department of Tax and Finance. So that's through the last quarterly payment, payment we received in February. Um, and those funds, the, eight, the 840,000 that we've received so far um, are exclusively dedicated under state law for purchasing and distributing reusable bags. Um, so that's part of the effort that we've had since 2016, very close partnership with, um, with you and with other council members, uh, council member Chin, um, to distribute more than a, a million reusable bags uh, to New Yorkers all across the city as part of our efforts to reduce plastic bag waste. No, that, that's good. I'm, I'm just so glad to hear that it is being implemented and we're getting the resource, uh, getting the money back to, to give out more reusable bags because a lot of people are carrying around the, the orange bag that we've been uh, giving out. We will uh, continue to do that. Um, in terms of composting, Right um, earlier at the, the press conference, I'm just talking about how do we, I mean, we started taking, my family, we started taking advantage of the composting site at the farmer's market right down here in Bowling Green. Um, and it's great. I mean, it's really cut down on the garbage that I put out uh, in my building. But down in Low Manhattan, I mean, every uh, garbage day, I see piles and piles of garbage. It's really just breaks my heart that how much garbage that we generate. So we do need to really promote um, this composting because if everybody does their part, I'm pretty sure we can cut, you know, cut the garbage down to more than half. And I just, you know, see it myself. Uh, so I think that we still need to really continue to do the outreach and education and to, um, provide more sites. Because right now we're, we're, I think the city and the council were funding the farmer's market. But so what is the department's uh, plan on promoting or really creating more drop-off sites within different neighborhoods? And what about also uh, thinking about working uh, with some of the local business improvement district? Like for example, in my district, I guess quite a few of them and if we can get them to work with us, um, that can definitely help uh, increase uh, the composting uh, organic waste uh, program. Uh, Councilwoman, thank you for the question. Um, so we've been doing uh, a lot uh, and we have uh, currently 121 food scrap drop-off sites, you know, operating in the city with the partnerships um, and you know, that's in, you know, like 46 uh, community boards have some place that you can bring something all the time. There's only 13 community boards that, that don't have, uh, you know, a year round uh, drop off. And we're, look, we're always looking to increase those partnerships. We are definitely looking for uh, 
for an increase of that program and definitely looking to, to you know, have more partners join us. We, we, we campaign, we definitely continue to support, uh, you know, thanks to the Grow NYC network and those partnerships. And there are a lot of individuals who want to take part in it. And we look for these, in, this is a great idea. And we look forward to working with you uh, and finding partners for, you know, your district and elsewhere in Manhattan. Um, and we think it would be a great idea. Uh, we're continuing to look and we've, our, our drop-off sites have been doing an, an incredible amount of uh, great work uh, throughout, particularly throughout this past 13 months of the pandemic. And uh, we definitely look for expansion in that. Well, the only way you could do that is with more funding because the, the 3.5 million that was reinstated definitely is not enough, right? So uh, we got it. For, for all programs, <laughs> funding is always great. So yeah. <laughs> um, and also I think my, my last point with that is that with uh, the federal stimulus money coming down, uh, are you in position with the, uh, your deputy mayor to fight for your share? Uh, I mean, we will advocate with you because if the money is coming down from the federal government, this is a great opportunity to expand some of the, the programs in different community um, to really help us reach the zero waste goals, uh, you know, goal. So uh, I don't want you to uh, not fight for the share. <laughs> understood and, uh, and, and fully, <laughs> I appreciate the sentiment of that. Uh, yes, we are still working with the administration and OMB and uh, on what restoration funds are coming. And uh, we're, we're optimistic that, that things will get better. We just are, are fine tuning and, and continuing the work and the discussions uh, on what's coming back and how, how we can move forward. That's good. I'm glad that you're optimistic. So we will work with you uh, on that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, no, so there's no more council member questions at the moment. Do you have more questions? Um, I do, one second. I'm sorry. I want to acknowledge that we've also been joined by Councilmember Deutsch and Councilmember Cabrera as well. Um, actually, um, I am. I'm okay um, right now. While I have my concerns, again, I just want to reiterate that I have my concerns over the original commitment of the administration related to its goals to get to zero waste. Um, I really feel like the council's hand is being forced here to uh, uh, incentivize the city to move forward um, with getting to zero waste. Um, unfortunately, it's going to end up falling on the hands of our next mayor, who I hope is more committed to achieving these goals than our current one. Um, so I'm, I'm okay with my questions to the administration. I'm just hoping that the administration could stay on or that DSNY could stay on to hear the testimony from these advocates that all want to be allies with the Department of Sanitation in achieving its goal to get to zero waste. What you're going to see is everyone wanting to be a partner. Not, want, not folks that want to attack the Department of Sanitation. Um, so I'm hoping that you can stay and, and, and meet and hear your allies um, and wanna move forward with our panelists. Uh, but thank you again, Commissioner Grayson, uh, Deputy Commissioner Gregory Anderson and Deputy Commissioner uh, Bridget Anderson. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearing, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. As I stated earlier, each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer and given you the cue to begin. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. We'd like to begin testimony with uh, Melissa Ishan. After Melissa, I will be calling on Eric Goldstein and then Tok Michelle Oyewole. Melissa? 
Thank you so much, Council. And um, I think this is the fir a first for me in all my years of testifying going first. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Good afternoon. My name is Melissa Yashan. I am Senior Supervising Counsel in the Environmental Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. I am here representing NILPI to underscore the importance of ensuring that our city diverts waste from landfills and incinerators, supports and expands diversion programs, including education and outreach, and continues to make the necessary investments in a robust organics program to begin to make a dent in the damage that our massive waste stream has done to environmental justice communities, but also to our planet as a whole. We are here today, a day before Earth Day, to shed light not only on the tragic failures of our city government to take even modest steps forward towards putting us on a path towards zero waste, but to highlight and demonstrate how uncomplicated and practical policies could make a critical diff difference to combating climate change. As a preliminary matter, we want to express our strong support for the bills being heard today, which together provide concrete goals and ways the city be can begin to right the wrongs of us collectively being responsible for sending an average of 3.2 million tons of waste to landfill and incineration from the residential side each year, plus another 2.5 million tons to landfill from the commercial side. There are many feasible and achievable policies the city can begin to implement immediately. In particular, the three R's should always guide our waste policy, reduce, reuse, recycle. Reduce, practical waste reduction policies will be detailed in my written testimony, but they include intro to 20, 2103, the food don donation bill, this important legislation advances the goal of ensuring that edible excess food is donated. This is particularly important given how COVID illuminated how prevalent food insecurity is in our city. We absolutely must do everything we can to ensure that edible food does not end up in landfill. Save as you throw. We urge the council and the administration to be, to consider implementing financial incentives for residences, including multifamily homes who consistently source separated recyclables to get financial benefits. These policies have been proven to reduce landfill bound waste significantly in other jurisdictions and should be utilized in New York City. Skip the stuff. The council has not yet heard another important piece of waste reduction legislation, intro 1775B, and we urge the council to calendar a hearing on this bill, which represents another step towards reducing our reliance on single use plastics. Plastic straw upon request. This legislation mandating that plastic straws be provided only upon request has been languishing in the council for more than three years. We are aware that the bill has been amended to account for concerns expressed by the disability rights community and urge the council to pass the amended legislation in short order. Reuse incentives. As many have already said, Various local and state governments have found that funding community repair and reuse programs, including broad educational services, does result in behavior change. We urge the city to follow suit. Organics recycling and community composting. We know that organic waste releases one of the most potent greenhouse gases, methane. Does somebody have something to say? Sorry. In high, in high, um, concentrations. We also know that organic waste moving through truck intensive transfer stations in EJ communities represents more than one third of the waste stream and contributes to the worst nuisance conditions for residents who live near these facilities. It is incumbent on our city to ensure that organic waste is taken out of our landfill and incinerator bound waste and instead used beneficially. Universal curbside organics recycling service. We at NILPI cannot underscore how important it is to ensure that the city offer universal curbside organic waste recycling services to every resident in every borough. We joined with our fellow advocates lamenting the suspension of the voluntary brown bin program, but we also know that the program was flawed. Rather than offering a voluntary piecemeal service only to certain residents, many who don't even know if they're eligible, the city must immediately begin plans to phase in mandatory universal curbside compost collection with the goal of requiring every household to source separate organic waste for collection. Equitably <laughs> throughout all boroughs. We support the core act and we further urge the committee to advance legislation that begins to address the issue of equitable access to city land for compost processing for small scale organizations who do this work to engage, educate and green their neighborhoods protect and preserve compost processing sites. In the same vein, the city must ensure that these essential organizations who have been filling the gap of collecting and processing organic waste so that it can continue to be diverted from landfill 
that they be protected, supported, and sustained. The current predicaments of imminent eviction by the city faced by at least three of the primary nonprofit compost project partners is unnecessary and downright wrong. The city should ensure that these and other community scale compost organizations who are beloved by their neighbors and communities always have a place in which to operate, educate, and enrich, especially on and within New York City parks land. We should also expand municipal organics processing via renewable rikers. According to the renewable rikers law passed by the city, as soon as this summer, the city can begin to transfer land and property from D DOC to be used by DSNY to establish and expand organic waste processing capacity on the island with the goal of a large processing operation that can one day receive source separated organic waste via barge, eliminating more of the need for truck polluting truck transport. Finally, the commercial waste stream ensure that the commercial waste zone system implements ambitious uh, diversion requirements and accountability. For far too long, the commercial waste industry has gotten away with failing to keep recyclables separated by generators separate and commingling source separated organic waste with other trash, sending all of this to landfill. For most of the last decade, our Transform Don't Trash New York City Coalition has pointed out how harmful this lack of compliance with, accountability for, and enforcement of diversion requirements in the commercial sanitation sector are. Finally, we have an opportunity to fix this and we must ensure that the discounts for recycling and organic services that were suggested in Local Law 199 are a part of every aspect of this new system. We also need to ensure that the, the waste haulers and facilities who co-mingle recyclables are penalized, not just the generators. Finally, we all know that the city's recycling rate lags behind almost every major cities in the United States at 18%. At this point in time, with recycling having been firmly ensconced in our city's psyche for decades, this is unexcusable. We must do more to ensure that Recycling enforcement is increased to adequately, adequately penalize those who, despite the prevalence and ease of separating recyclables, continue to lag behind. And we must not stop funding and supporting education regarding recycling for all ages and all boroughs in our city. We also know that recycling creates more than twice the jobs than traditional landfill bound waste um, in sanitation. As though environmental and climate justice weren't good reason enough to ensure expansion of recycling, then the creation of good green jobs will hopefully seal the deal. We are so grateful for the leadership of Chair Reynoso in continuing to highlight the serious issues surrounding our city's waste processing and management. We look forward to continuing our work together with him and the administration to ensure that no time is wasted in setting us on an efficient and effective path to real waste reduction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Eric Goldstein, followed by Toke Michelle Oyewale and Eric Fasher. Eric Goldstein. Turn thank again. you. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, thank you, Chairman Reynoso, and thank you to Council Members Chin and Rosenthal, who've been such great friends of the environment and solid waste for so many years. We, we've been here for a long time on these issues, and unfortunately, we're not making the progress that we should be. Thanks for holding this hearing to focus on the mayor's uh, achieving the ambitious goal of sending zero waste to landfills. Unfortunately, the administration's performance hasn't matched the rhetoric. I'm gonna summarize my written statement, but basically without dramatic change, the chances of achieving anything close to zero waste to landfills by 2030 are slim indeed. And failing to achieve this milestone would be more than a blot on Mayor de Blasio's environmental legacy. It would represent a government-wide failure to achieve fundamental environmental policy reform. And for New Yorkers, the result will be more air pollution, increased global warming emissions, and continuing environmental injustice. Although the government's intent to move in the direction of zero waste goes back to 1989, it was Mayor de Blasio who formally adopted the zero waste to landfills goal six years ago when he released his first sustainability plan. This was done with a lot of great fanfare and the plan included eight specific initiatives that would be implemented to move the city closer to zero waste. Unfortunately, except for progress on commercial waste reform and action uh, to reduce plastic carry out bags, the city's movement on these initiatives has been limited indeed. The number one zero waste initiative to expand organics collection, both its curbside and convenient drop off locations uh, has simply not achieved its objectives. Initiative four called for enhancing recycling collections in among other places, New York City housing authority developments. 
no progress there. Initiative number five called to make all schools zero waste schools. Once again, setbacks in that area. Initiative six, expansion of textile and electronic waste recycling. Setback again, same story for save as you throw collections. So we haven't made a lot of progress and we've been moving in the wrong direction. Here are four critical steps the council should take in 2021 to get the city back on track. First, the council should enact a new law establishing a mandatory universal program for separated collection of food scraps and yard waste from every city household. This would deal with the single largest source of global warming emissions from the waste sector and divert these wastes from landfills to efficient composting and anaerobic digestion and community composting sites. The $3.5 million for community composting that was just mentioned by the commissioner is wholly inadequate. The patient is still in intensive care and barely alive. Funding needs to, restore, uh, to be restored to pre-COVID levels for expanded community composting as a short-term measure. Uh, the renewable Rikers piece involving well, composting needs to be moving forward as well. And we'll never achieve our goals if we don't uh, advance a universal composting collection. Second, the council needs to provide sufficient funding to ensure full implementation of its landmark commercial waste zone legislation. This was an historic advance, but it isn't self-enforcing and the department needs funds both for its own resources and a consultant to make sure that this program advances and is implemented in 2021. Third, the council should restore funding for recycling and composting collections at every public school and at NYCHA developments around the city. The city's school aid youngsters must learn how and why to recycle and compost so that these activities become second nature. And NYCHA residents are entitled to be working with their own uh, organizations, their own nonprofits to have economic incentives and engage their neighbors to reverse the city's dismal record on solid waste performance at NYCHA products, uh, projects. Finally, the council should advance legislation that would make plastic straws, plastic utensils, and other throwaway plastics available only on request. Finally, intro 844, a small step in the right direction, we recommend the bill be amended to set goals of 50% waste reduction sent to landfills and incinerators by 2030 and 90% reduction to both of those facilities by 2035. Intro 2103 would require food service establishments to post additional information on food donation portholes. We love that and strongly support that bill. Intro 2250, DSNY would report on the city's progress in sending zero waste to landfills. We support this bill but without the kinds of actions outlined above and more set forth in our written testimony, those progress reports will be very short indeed. But we've still got time. We're counting on our champions in the city council to move a comprehensive set of legislation forward in the current year. And we thank you for your attention. Thank you. Next will be Toke Michelle Oyewoye, followed by Eric Batcher, followed by Rebecca Stadnam. Time begins. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Dr. Tok Oyewole, and I'm testifying on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. And we'll submit my full written testimony and make abridged comments today. Since 1991, NIJA has led efforts for comprehensive policy reforms to address the disproportionate burden of New York's solid waste system on a handful of environmental justice communities in the city, with impacts greatest in a few low-income communities and communities of color where truck dependent transfer stations are clustered. Outside of New York City, we rely on a system of truck based export, where our waste is sent to landfills and incinerators in neighboring and distant communities, from as nearby as predominantly black and brown Newark, New Jersey, to as far away as Virginia and South Carolina. Burning large amounts of trash in combustion chambers, some incinerators use heat to produce electricity, similar to the technology of a coal plant. Although there is an attempt to claim that waste to energy is sustainable, it is one of the most emission intensive ways to generate energy and the health, environmental and climate impacts are manifold, including up to 2.5 more times more greenhouse gases than coal-based energy production, concentrating toxins that lead to cancers and other health effects um, from elements such as dioxins, lead and cadmium in the ash that is then transferred to landfills or hazardous material sites. It is clear that our system of over-reliance on excess waste generation and export to facilities is not only unsustainable, 
but polluting and poisoning environmental justice communities and our planet. Today, I need to name our country's violence against black, brown and indigenous communities, that it was by design that the US named certain bodies exploitable and killable in certain neighborhoods, both in and out of New York City as sacrifice zones for waste and material disposal. Zero waste needs to be a comprehensive strategy that is brought to include zero waste incineration. Again, it is an act of violence to continue to deem these predominantly black and brown communities as our city's sacrifice zones, all while exacerbating debating the climate crisis. And it is shameful that the administration seems to quietly, um, seems quietly committed to perpetuating, perpetuating reliance on this dirty waste management strategy. And I would urge the administration to change its tune. Relatedly, we need to zero in on what we mean when we're talking about zero waste. It's important to aim for solutions high on the zero waste hierarchy, including redesigning our systems and reduction of waste before it is generated and disposed with bold changes such as universal use of reusables and refillables in restaurants, retail, shipping, personal care, and household products. Recycling is good, but this still requires energy to transform materials that are generated and discarded after limited use. So it should be a lower priority than waste avoidance to begin with. Of note, recycling facilities also tend to be clustered in communities of color. We hope to see textile origination labeling and stocking reduction to prevent extractive and polluting practices and avoid the 6% of waste from New York City that has textiles. We hope to see donation programs for food and other goods requiring partnerships with retailers. We urge for comprehensive demand planning tools and technologies to avoid waste in retail and restaurants. Um, we are happy to talk about diversion from other niche streams as well. Critically, we are a large proponent of community composting as co-organizers of the Save Our Compost Coalition, and we need to see compost processing sites expanded locally. Happy to see the city council include this in their budget response, and we hope this will undergird a universal organic collection program when implemented. Of note, big reuse and low reside ecology centers still do not have guaranteed homes after they were threatened with eviction by New York City Parks Department, and now the status of earth matter is at risk as well. With regards to the facilities in the city, we hope to see um, waste facilities in Southeast Queens brought up to code for being grand grandfathered into an M1 <laughs> mixed residential zone and an upholding of capacity reductions under waste equity uh, rather than increases, which would be antithetical to zero waste goals. And we encourage fair share distribution by borough. We and uh, the Transform Don't Trash Coalition are glad to see the city council's budget response affirm uh, and ask for staffing for oversight of commercial waste zones. Again, I'll submit expanded written testimony and thank you for the opportunity to raise these urgent concerns. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Eric Batcher, followed by Rebecca Sabnam, followed by Hudson Ethan. Time begins. Good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso and members of the Sanitation Committee. I'm Eric Botcher, a resident of Council District 3. It's great to see so many friends here today. I want to commend Council Members Rosenthal, Kalos, and Reynoso for these important bills. I believe that organic waste recycling is the future of sanitation. In Council District 3, we worked with DSNY to win curbside pickup at large buildings like West Beth, Penn South and Manhattan Plaza and created new drop-off locations throughout the district. But we've got to mandate universal composting services for all residents, residents and businesses like California did last year. This could divert more than a million tons of garbage from landfills each year, reducing carbon emissions, preventing rodent infestation and improving sidewalk conditions. To keep truck emissions down and create green jobs, we need to locally process as much of the food and yard and plant waste as possible. Local residents should be trained and hired to process composting on site and create rooftop urban farms, also addressing food insecurity. Additionally, the city should use organic waste to generate clean energy locally, which could potentially be done at new green energy hub on Rikers Island. We've got to do better at recovering edible unsold food. Uh, this will reduce greenhouse gas emissions and also help New Yorkers experiencing food insecurity. 68% of all the food that is discarded in New York City is still edible. So I urge you to pass Helen Rosenthal's intro 2103 that'll reduce food waste by creating a communication portal for food donors and recipients. 
we've got to phase out single use plastics that are killing our marine ecosystems and littering our neighborhoods. The Department of Sanitation collected roughly 36 million pounds of single use plastics from homes across the five boroughs in 2017 and an estimated tens of millions of pounds from commercial establishments. I support piloting reusable water bottle refilling stations at fire hydrants like they did successfully in Montreal. Even at the most progressive meetings in New York, when you walk in the door of the room, there's a pallet of bottled water. We can't continue with this. So much more needs to be done to achieve zero waste to landfill and incineration by 2030. But New Yorkers are an unstoppable force when we set our sights on a goal. I look forward to making this a reality and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Rebecca Shabnam, followed by Hudson Aethis, followed uh, by Rhonda Kaiser. Yeah, Eric, it's nice to see you on the other side of the of the screen for once. I just wanted to give you a shout out. It's nice to see you, brother. You too. All right. Time begins. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Shalnam. I am a 12th grader in Brooklyn Latin. And I wanted to urge um, all of you to please support the bills that we've talked about previously. So in my school, um, which we don't have any like type of like zero waste management system. I tried to implement um, a zero waste system with the help of cafeteria culture um, to get my school to be zero waste, but I did not expect it to be as hard as it was. One of the first problems that we actually came across was the fact that our school was not on the route for organics collection. And there was no way for that we would be able to become zero waste if one of the big components of the system, which is you know composting wasn't there. And it shouldn't be that hard for us. And we're not the only school that's like this. Uh, the budget cuts uh, to composting did not help that either. This kind of environmental justice is not acceptable. My school and other black and brown communities um, like it deserve more access to organic collection. And not only do these communities not have access to the same organic collection, but they also have to bear the burdens of landfills and incineration in their own backyards. So you can't sacrifice the lives of black and brown communities, but not also give them the resources to organic collection. This environmental racism must be addressed if we want to even attempt to meet the zero waste by 2030 goal. And which is why I uh, urge you to support the, the bills. Thank you. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Hudson Athis, followed by Rhonda Kaiser, followed by Debbie Lee Cohen. I'm right, I keep interrupting in between the, the conversations. I just wanna give a huge shout out to Rebecca and the amazing work she does as a young person, uh, being front and center on these issues consistently from the beginning. Um, it, brings, uh, it's a, it's a, it brings me joy to know that Rebecca is gonna be the one that starts handling, the, handling this work after we're all gone. I'm really excited about it. So keep up the good work. Um, <laughs> keep up the good work. And we'll be out of your way in no time, Rebecca. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good morning, Chairman Ranso and Sanitation Committee members. My name is Hudson Athis. Uh, I'm a 10th grader at Nest Plus M, which is on the Lower East Side. And I'm also with Cafeteria Culture. So my experience with uh, learning about waste management through Cafeteria Culture while seeing the of abhorrent conditions of the schools where every day there is litter all over the floor, even on days where it's not necessary. For example, on pizza days, students don't need utensils. They still take them out of habit and it creates massive waste. And it's frustrating to see this, nothing being done about it. And also to turn around and see my local government talking about zero waste by 2030 without seeing any change. Um, and the solutions to these problems are not extremely complicated. There, there's a bill uh, currently being proposed called Skip the Stuff that would require customers ordering food to opt in to have utensils. A, the schools could very easily operate under a similar system where students would have to ask for plastic utensils, or um, they would 
bring personal utensils and metal utensils from home. None of these would cost the schools extra money or demand extra resources. These are simple solutions that can be done. As well as, um, sorry, uh, uh, so, I'm sorry. I all, we also need to improve education about these these waste management systems. In my school, which prided which prides itself on its waste management, I have learned nothing about our systems, and I only learned through cafeteria culture, and that's something that definitely needs to be addressed because it is a part of achieving zero waste to teach students how to do it themselves. This is not going to be done by twenty our the goal of a 2030 zero waste New York cannot be done without massive changes to weight the ways the schools manage their waste. I will yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Hudson, for that testimony. Um, just feeling, again, just the joy coming from our young people um, and the lack of support that they have uh, when it comes to education and like civic engagement on trash issues, on uh, many issues is a big problem, but I uh, love to see that we have two young people here. And I hope uh, if there's a third and fourth one, just really want to shout out all the young people doing this work. Um, I think we all, we are very happy. You make us all very proud. Thank you, Hudson. Thank you. Next up is Rhonda Kaiser, followed by Debbie Lee Cohen, followed by Marcel Tenison. I begins. Hi, thank you, Chairman Minoso and members of the Sanitation Committee. I am Rhonda Kaiser. I'm Outreach Director with Cafeteria Culture. And I'm testifying today about single-use plastic in school lunch on behalf of our fifth grade student partners from PSMS 188, the Island School in Manhattan. They couldn't be here today. Um, we first wanna thank the DOE's Office of Food and Nutrition for the lifeline of 500,000 meals that they provide every day across New York City. So since the pandemic started, cafeteria culture has been faced with a challenge. Without being physically present in schools, could we, with students as partners, still collect data and visually document school lunch to continue to inform policy as we have been doing for the past 12 years? Our students answered this challenge with skill and flair. After learning about the impact of plastic pollution from extraction to manufacture to disposal, our fifth graders wanted to know what they could do to help. So our students have been documenting the single use plastic in their lunches. Equipped with our camcorders and their very resourceful brains, they are quantifying the single use plastic items, then iterating and troubleshooting alternative solutions. They are supporting their recommendations using their own data. Students discovered for themselves in our desktop lunch survey that each lunch has an average of seven plastic pieces that they use for only 20 minutes while they eat. In our math lesson, they calculated that seven pieces of plastic packaging in each of, five, of the 500,000 lunches served every day means that our school lunches across the city produce 3,500,000 pieces of plastic trash every day. Here are some of our students' practical solutions to reduce single-use plastic in their lunches. Brian introduced the idea to reuse and wash plates and utensils instead of throwing it all out. Jeremiah added that we could use one crate to bring the milk to classrooms for lunch and not use a separate bag for each milk carton like they do now. Julia suggested that they could bring our own spoons and forks and wash them after we eat. Our fifth graders couldn't be here, but they asked me to share this data with you. If we do nothing and fail to make a zero waste plan by 2030, the seven single use plastic items in 500,000 school lunches used for 20 minutes will continue to multiply. 3.5 million in one day becomes 630 million in one year, which becomes 5.7 billion in the nine years we have left before 2030. That's 5.7 billion pieces of plastic packaging in school lunch alone. Elijah worries, if we don't do something now, probably soon the world's gonna be filled with water instead of land. These wise, resourceful, and hopeful students thank you, especially for intro 2250, and offer their services if the DSNY needs help to develop a clear zero waste plan. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Debbie Lee Cohen, followed by Marcel Kernigan, followed by Robert Marquis. Time begins. Hi, thank you. I'm Debbie Lee Cohen from Cafeteria Culture. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso and council members. Thank you so much for this opportunity, not just for me to speak, 
but for youth to speak, and thank you for letting Rhonda speak on behalf of the fifth graders at PS 188, just to let you know, they will be meeting with the directors of the Office of Food and Nutrition Services of Department of Ed to share their data. And on that note, I'd like to say, I'd just like to shout out to um, DOE Offices of Nutrition and Food Services, as well as sustainability, that they've done incredible work partnering with us and their efforts to work towards zero waste have been great and commendable. And we will continue to work with them. I'm going to talk today specifically about, um, in support of the bills that have been mentioned as well as the skip the stuff and the straw bills, but certainly about establishing a zero by 30 goal and for schools and to quote, this isn't in my written testimony, but to quote our former chair of Manhattan Swab and former uh, commissioner of sanitation, there is no plan without a timeline. And I hope Brendan Sexton doesn't mind that I quoted him on that. But I think about that all the time when anybody introduces a plan without a timeline. On that note, um, we do have an over-reliance, as you heard, of single-use plastic items and plastic packaging in the school waste stream, which is also comprised of 50% organics, according to the Department of Sanitation 2017 study. A citywide school organics collection program is still waiting to happen, and we need creative ideas, bold action, and increased funding for small-scale pilots that can be easily expanded in order to achieve zero waste by 2030 based on over a decade of leading school cafeteria waste audits and pilots, um, here are a few of our suggestions from cafeteria culture for how we might achieve zero waste. And I look forward to meeting with you, Chair Reynoso, and sharing more detail, which is also in our um, written testimony. First, we should reduce single-use items and single-use plastics in DOE school food service. We should set a target date, working with both City Council, Department of Sanitation, and of course, Department of Ed, so that we no longer use condiment packets. We've already seen in many school cafeterias, they're not, you know, you can use pump jars. Uh, you tend wrapping that's not that's around compostables it's ridiculous to have compostable utensils in non-recyclable packaging and our school food directors are aware of that and there's an enormous amount of plastic film wrap being used right now um, we asked for the city council to support a citywide plastic free lunch day cafeteria culture ran a small pilot of this in brooklyn it's in our movie microplastic madness and it's a great way, again, it shows how a very small pilot, it was a lot of work, but it was one school. We could see easily how we could scale that up and we have enough data to see how that could work citywide. And then we could have a one day a week menu day, a plastic free menu day, such as pizza day. It's already almost exists. Um, we could also mm -hmm. revise DOE contract requirements. This is long overdue. Uh, contractors are rewarded by the best price but, there, but considerations do not um, include, for instance, minimal or no packaging waste or um, other sustainable practices or how they treat their employees or other uh, greenhouse gas emissions that might be related to their product life cycle. In terms of reducing wasted school food, we don't like to use the word food waste or uh, um, so we're trying to think of other ways to term this because this is not waste. This is, this is golden resource. Um, I just want to say we need composting for all and we need plate, ra plate waste reduction pilots. And this should happen immediately. And third, zero waste climate literacy for all P through 12 students, beginning with pre-K. Our mayor missed an amazing opportunity when we rolled out these pre-K programs. They are learning how to sort but not the, what they're eating for lunch. And here they're eating right in the cafeteria. So I look forward to sharing more ideas. We have additional ideas about refillables, um, uh, water refill stations that could be funded by um, federal stimulus money. We're already talking about that with school food directors and also about a climate education bill that's now in the New York State Senate that could use city council support and also city council suggestions. It needs to be uh, better worded. And I feel that New York City is in the absolute position in New York State to assist with that. Thank you so much for the time and thank you council members and chair and Department of Sanitation uh, officials who are still here for all the great work that you've done. I look forward to really achieving zero waste by 2030 with a timeline. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you so much, um, Debbie. I just, you know, seeing you, 
brings back memories of sort of being on the steps of City Hall and um, so many times your creative advocacy is um, brilliant. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for all your um, really creative energy, thoughtful approach to working with kids. And, you know, you're so right. Someone like you has to be in the room when policy folks, the mayor's policy folks, are talking about whatever the issue is, right? So that we are bringing this zero waste lens um, to every public policy. So anyway, I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, mentioned one thing, I'm, I'm gonna watch the um, video you mentioned, but there was something else you mentioned that I was gonna ask you to send along. Maybe we can just, if you could send me your testimony um, and we can talk offline, I would really appreciate it. So anyway, thank you for everything. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for city council support um, for that's helped to keep our uh, pilot education programs going. Oh, thank you for saying that. Actually, that's just reminded me. It was the notion of what we could try to get FEMA reimbursement for. Oh, so we've already discussed this with the directors of school food and also with our um, Plastic Pollution Coalition nationally. I mean, the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. But there is money going to school cafeterias and it would be incredible. It, obviously, it's not enough money for the dream, which is to redo school kitchens all across New York City and put in dishwashers, you know, that would be amazing, but that's not there. What there is enough money for is to put refill stations in every school cafeteria. Uh, and gotcha. water, cl healthy, clean drinking water, as Rebecca spoke about earlier, this is a huge issue in a lot of schools. School food does, is required now. They have these water jets in many school cafeterias with plastic cups. They don't want yeah. to use their refillable bottles because they don't have enough time to pay their employees to keep refilling it. And then there's all these other issues and then it's in plastic and then it goes on so and on. Could you do me a favor? Could you forward that on to me? Yes. Um, Cause I, I'd like to try to make that happen. You're, you're talking to the people. Um, I wanna help lift your voice. Fantastic, I'll be sending. Okay, as always. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Marcel Turnovan, followed by Robert Marcus, followed by Jaden T. Haynes. Time begins. Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. My name is Marcel Kerners, and I'm currently a junior of the New York Harbor School and part of the Marine Affairs CTE program. I'm speaking in support of all the bills mentioned today, as as well as for the, as well as for the benefits of these bills, specifically job creation and STEM education. The bill, these bills will open up job creation because because more people will be needed to to help deliver, pick up, and mandate these comp these compost sites and waste. It's, this has been a tough year for everyone and people could you people could need the chance to get back up on their feet as well as help out the city as well as help out the city in a small way but that can make a major difference. This also has helped my education I am currently in a program which teaches us about the environment and how it re how it reacts to certain things especially cities and marine and marine life this real life i know that kids all over the city hell all over the all over the state could use the could use things that i am learning and that we could teach just by just by watching what we eat and what we throw away and how can it be reused how can it be reused and reduced through what we through what we do and how sorry i'm a little bit nervous today through what we do and how we do it. In conclusion, this bill can to help the current generation get through this difficult time, hopefully to the year 2022, and can help future generations better, better this city and help them learn about environmental stability and so they can change this world for the better. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you. you did a great job. Thank you, Marcel. Next up is Robert Marcus followed by Kaden T. Haynes, followed by Kara Garcia. Time begins. Uh, yeah, that's my student, Marcel. It's gonna be a tough act to follow. 
Uh, thanks everybody for allowing me to speak today. Uh, much of it is in the same vein as other speakers. Uh, my name is Rob Murkowski. I'm the sustainability coordinator and teacher of Marine Affairs at New York Harbor School. I'm in support of the expansion, planning and oversight of New York City's zero waste goal. I believe the current bills start the process of shifting our culture to this goal. I think oversight, data analysis, and reimagining how this goal is reached are very present. Uh, however, I found planning, reimagining plans, oversight, and collecting data sometimes only go so far. Uh, while reading 2250 from A through I, it's the same process my students that are present today and I go through yearly um, to make zero waste happen at our school. Uh, generally, needless to say, our plan to go zero waste is always foiled. Uh, plans, goals need to be committed, followed through, and constantly real, uh, reimagined and realistic. Lastly, they don't need to be combated by a system uh, that is often mismanaged with empty promises. Uh, often the zero waste initiatives are only carried out by those who know it's the right thing to do. In addition, systems like the DOE see them as something that will kind of happen uh, from the people that care, in my opinion, of course. Uh, more importantly, these initiatives are sometimes isolated uh, with success stories, but not system-wide. Um, you can't talk about waste management unless you talk about the environment. You can't talk about the environment unless you talk about economics. You can't talk about economics unless you talk about the inequities of systemic racism in class. These issues of zero waste are very intersectional. Year in and year out, I'm pursuing the mandated DOE initiative of having a sustainability coordinator. I'm left to manage the system without much support or the power of be listening to the changes the students want. We are left with poor sorting stations, lunch materials, and more plastic than I can count. The functions of the DOE almost make this zero waste goal impossible. Now this, statement's come from, this statement comes from my personal opinion from a campus that can sort its own food scraps make compost and focus on marine education. Uh, I'm behind, I don't need ideas at this moment. Uh, we kind of need action. Uh, for instance, we have a dishwasher, soap won't be bought and people don't want to empty it. Uh, as my students teach me, many of us function out of convenience or necessity. We need to make waste divergence accessible and convenient for all. So the powers need to consult stakeholders who do this work in their communities and for those that are impact, impacted by the progress, or for instance, the lack of thereof. This needs to be the purposeful and invested with the view that this will pay off later. Although we need a balanced budget and planning zero waste, the main goal shouldn't be monetary return, although a factor shouldn't be the driving force. I think one of the main stakeholders that can contribute to this goal are public schools. Um, however, currently they aren't uh, supported I'll just close with this. Uh, my students are here today with me. They're ready to help and are trained to do so. Just wanna close with one little story. Currently the students that are present today and myself are collecting food scraps from students that are going to school at home remotely because uh, either they don't have access to drop off sites because of COVID or they never had access to it. Um, so I just wanna close with that little personal story. So thanks for letting me speak. Thank you. Next up is Jaden T. Ham, followed by Kiara Garcia, followed by Gabriella McAlvin. Time begins. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Jaden Hames. I'm a junior attending New York Harbor School and a member of the Environmental Advocacy and Marine Affairs Program. The speaker before, Robert Markuski, is my teacher, and I'm a part of his program to help sustainability and um, overall Earth Matter. Today, you know, like we all have, I want to address the issue of opportunities and environmental sustainability. I support the policies uh, 2250 and 844 for this specific reason, as they focus on not only encouraging environmental awareness in all communities, but providing opportunities for jobs uh, and communities working together in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic. By supporting the proposed laws, and bills, we can set in place a new stage for younger generations and older generations in all communities to take interest in environmental sustainability with the added benefit of providing jobs in these fields. Funding these bills and reinstating the previous funding will not only help the community in the short term, but as well as in the long term by getting members of all groups exposed to careers and studies for our generation, leading to the 
uh, leading to the development of sustainability efforts and job availability. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Kiara Garcia, followed by Gabriella McAlpin, followed by Jay Pelt. Time begins. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Kiara Garcia. I'm an intern for Earth Matter and Marine Affairs and also a student at the Urban Assembly New York Harbor School. I am here before you all to talk about the importance of becoming a more sustainable city towards this, oh, wait, yeah, of becoming a more sustainable city and adjusting towards this would allow us to become zero waste and will create more job opportunities for people, meaning potentially help and homelessness. Creating these opportunities will help highlight the issues we face now and can be facing later on in the future, such as water and air pollution, sea levels rising, and not enough arable land to grow crops on. By becoming more sustainable, we will exempt these issues from later on in the future, but that's if we start now. This city is going to constantly keep growing, and as it grows, sustainability needs to grow with it. Sustainability needs to be a part of our lives and not just an afterthought. Our current economic system is more focused on creating millionaires and not creating a more sustainable environment. We need to do better, and in order to do that, we need to educate not only ourselves, but the future generation as well. We need to make this a part of our educational system, and we need to clean up after ourselves, compost, reuse, and recycle. Both legislation 20 to 50 and 844 will help put this all in act because our current system doesn't do enough. Yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Gabriella McAlpin, followed by Jay Peltz, followed by Carlos Pastel Cruz. You know, I just want to keep reiterating to these young people, thank you so much. Um, and to their mentors and their teachers that are also empowering them to, to, to be here um, and speak. Uh, they've done a great job. Jaden, thank you as well. I know that we missed you guys. You're doing amazing work. Keep, keep it up. And I think uh, Councilmember Chin wants to say something as well. Councilmember Chin. Yes, I am so proud of this student because Harbor School is in my district, Governor's Island. And they Oh, stop, stop bragging, Councilmember Chin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but, but Chair Winoso, there is going to be a middle school in every borough. A middle, uh, yeah, Harbor School Middle School in every borough. Um, and we just got the, you know, okay to expand Harbor School on Governor's Island. So we're going to have a pool there, a gym. I mean, it's great. And just looking at these students, I am so proud. Um, that we, we're here to support them and they are the one that's gonna lead the way uh, yeah. to make sure that we get zero raised by 2030 and beyond. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. And thank you to all the teachers and, and uh, Debbie, I mean, you guys guide these students and, and really help us. I just so, so appreciate, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Keep it up, keep it up. Let's keep it moving, let's go. <laughs> thank you. Um, Hello everyone. My name is my name is Gabrielle McAlpin of the Marine Affairs and Advocacy CTE from New York Harbor School. I'm an 11th grader and I'm an active I'm an active environmentalism advocate and I've always been invested in the environment and how the city and its councilmen handle slash take care of it. I've participated in the plastic bag ban. It helps give away reusable bags and I've participated in the climate change protest two years in a row. Protecting the environment is now one of my core values, and I just hope I can, can, I can help and vote change at the age I am now. A brief synopsis of the bill I'm supporting on, on, sorry, on, on or before July 1st, 2021, New York City's mayor and, and administrator must support the bill of, of sending zero waste to land bills. Along with creating more waste diversion sites, plan to reuse, reuse and recycle more materials and an analysis of zero waste economic and ever, ever, environmental perks. Seeing as other city already took the initiative to, do, to ban the use of plastic bags and how it had more positive impacts than negative IELTS, why not go the whole way? I know some of you are internally asking, what opportunities can zero waste create? I'll use an example. My school has an issue we call the Earth Cup. It's a device we use to break down all biodegradable materials and food scraps into compost. And of course, the Earth Tub can fuel itself. It takes the work of myself and my fellow colleagues to sort, record, and weigh the waste before it reaches the tub. 
my colleagues, um, they already presented before me, they're here, they're awesome. There are so many turning cogs in the system, and this is all on a tiny island just off the coast of Manhattan. Imagine the amount of opportunities and jobs zero waste can create throughout the city. And some of you might argue, but we already have pre-existing waste programs and stations throughout the city, which is true, but they're only in certain areas, more financially well-off areas of the city. The same neighborhoods with less people of color and with a Trader Joe's or a Whole Foods every few blocks. The areas that could really financially and environmentally benefit from these systems are completely disregarded by the city. I have never seen a waste collection site or even a Whole Foods that could be considered a bad neighborhood in the Bronx, in Bronx, Queens, Manhattan, or Brooklyn. For example, I'm from Corona, Queens, and I and we don't have like the most amazing thing, um, the most like nice thing we have is like a Marshalls or a Century 21 that's now closed. But um, going on to my point again, while the rest is considered a bad, no, I read that part. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. People of people of color deserve these zero waste too. Quoting my mentor, as the city grows, this should grow, not disappear. Sustainability should be part of every plan and not an afterthought. Thank you. I hope that was good. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Jay Powell, followed by Carlos Costal Croak, followed by Christine Higgle. Time begins. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Food Industry Alliance regarding intro 2103. My name is Jay Peltz and I manage Downstate Government Relations for FIA, a nonprofit profit trade association that advocates on behalf of grocery, drug and convenience stores throughout the state. While FIA and its members support efforts to reduce hunger in New York, including our members donation of at least hundreds of thousands of pounds of food every year, we respectfully oppose this legislation. Neighborhood grocers have never faced a more difficult regulatory and operating environment. I refer you to my submitted testimony for details. This context should be considered when proposing additional regulatory burdens. In addition, this legislation should be considered in the context of the New York State Food Donation and Food Scraps Recycling Law. This statute requires large generators of food scraps to donate excess edible food, quote, to the maximum extent practicable. The proposed DEC rule impl implementing the state law defines, quote, maximum extent practicable as the degree to which the maximum amount of edible food can be donated for human consumption without jeopardizing human health and the environment by implementing best management practices, taking into account cost effectiveness and feasibility. This legislation goes well beyond this requirement, specifically requiring that stores offer excess food for donation, arrange for the retrieval of the excess food by its recipient, and if requested by a donee, arrange for the transportation of the excess food. It does not require that donations be, quote, practicable no, or not jeopardize human health. These higher standards are onerous and unnecessary considering our members' food donations and recycling. In addition, due to the city's organic waste diversion law, grocers operating in the city are specifically excluded from the state law. In other words, the state exempted the city's grocers from its food donation mandate because the city's organic waste diversion law makes it unnecessary to include them since food can be recycled, can be donated or recycled and not wind up in an incinerator or a landfill. We see no rationale for the city to have, a to have a conflicting view. As noted above, FIA's members donate at least hundreds of thousands of pounds of food every year. Additional tons are recycled. The exemption incorporated into the bill does not reflect the pattern of this philanthropy, since it only applies if food is donated at least once a month to two or more not-for-profit organizations. The bill also gives rise to significant legal issues. According to the legal dictionary, the legal definition of a donation is, quote, the act by which the owner of the thing voluntarily transfers the title and possession of the same from himself to another person without any consideration, a gift, voluntarily transfers. Requiring stores to offer excess food for donation makes the offer involuntary, which means it is not a donation. If it is not a donation, then what is it? Is it a taking a private property without compensation? Is mandating that grocers use their resources to arrange for the retrieval and transportation of the excess food also taking a private property without compensation? Please share with us the city's legal rationale establishing that a required contribution of private property is in fact a donation. The proposed local law also raises a First Amendment issue by compelling commercial speech through the mandated notice offering excess food for donation. This is a complicated issue that should be analyzed further to ensure that an unconstitutional obligation is not imposed on the city's grocers. Finally, the penalties authorized under the legislation are excessive. 
The failure to comply with the law results in a penalty of up to $10,000 for each month during which a store fails to post the required notice. Basically, the maximum penalty can be $60,000. It's much more, these penalties are much higher than the penalties specified in the organic waste diversion law, and even higher potentially than the penalties for committing certain crimes. Um, while we respectfully oppose the proposed local law, we support increasing food donations. We are happy to explore ways of accomplishing that goal with Council Member Rosenthal and the other committee members. Accordingly, we respectfully ask that the bill be held in committee while such discussions occur around some uh, legal issues. I'm sorry. Time's expired. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Carlos Castel Croak, followed by Christine Higgle, followed by Phoebe Flaherty. Clock is ready. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Carlos Castel Croak, and I am the associate for New York City programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. Uh, NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City, and we are committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. I'd like to thank Chair Reynoso and for all the council members on the committee for the opportunity to testify today. NYLCV, along with many New Yorkers and climate advocates, strongly believe that reducing our waste is essential to fighting climate change. Food encompasses a third of our city's waste, and when that, this waste is put into landfills, it produces a significant amount of methane, a greenhouse gas, 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Furthermore, the city produces a substantial amount of waste through single-use plastics, such as plastic straws and takeout utensils. These items often end up in our waterways and streets where they can be harmful to wildlife. However, with proper waste reduction and recycling methods in place, we can develop and implement a climate-smart approach to waste management. Since the curbside compost pilot was scrapped and waste reduction programs were heavily defunded in the FY21 budget, we believe that it is more important than ever to double down on Mayor de Blasio's stated goal of sending zero waste landfills by the year 2030. The New York League of Conservation Voters Education Fund and our climate tracker, which reports on the city's progress towards many of the environmental goals in 1NYC, estimates that in order to achieve zero by 30, we must reduce our waste by 8% each year on average. To average this kind of, to achieve this kind of reduction, we will need strong commitments from all stakeholders and bold legislation that tackles waste head on. NYLCV therefore strongly supports introductions 2215-844 as they will get us back on track with the waste reduction goals established in 1NYC. Intro 2250 will require the Department of Sanitation reports regularly on the city's progress towards this goal, and intro 844 will codify the goal into the city's administrative uh, code. These bills will enforce the commitment originally established in 1NYC and ensure the level of accountability that we need to achieve this goal. These bills will be an important step towards achieving zero by 30, but there is still much more work to be done. In order to achieve zero by 30, we will need to bring back curbside compost, the curbside compost program, expand it to serve all New Yorkers and take other actions to reduce waste and increase recycling. We look forward to working with the New York City Council on implementing the bold and progressive waste reduction laws that will put us on the path towards zero by 30. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. <clears throat> Next will be Christina Heckel, followed by Phoebe Clarity, followed by Christine Dave Romero. Clock is ready. Thank you. My name is Christine Hagel, and I'm a board member of a nonprofit neighborhood sustainability and redemption center called Sure We Can in the East Williamsburg IBZ of Brooklyn. In this capacity and as a board member of, Can of the Canner Advocacy Task Force and a researcher focused on how informal workers help cities capture renewable materials in the waste stream, I firstly want to express full support for intro 844, the city zero waste by 2030 goal. The question is, how can this stated goal become a plan as suggested in intro 202050 to encourage citizen participation and utilize the expertise and dedicated labor of informal waste workers? Research from around the globe shows us that waste pickers who are skilled in post-consumer material segregation can be the key to reaching material recovery targets. Our zero waste plan for resource recovery can and should be inclusive. 
For New York City to reach zero waste goals by 2030, we have to think of every New Yorker as a critical node in material recovery value chains. And we need to understand that convenience is key to resource recovery. This means that every New Yorker needs to have convenient locations to bring post-consumer materials that have untapped value. New Yorkers need neighborhood sustainability centers to learn critical repair skills so that they can reuse rather than throw away and to bring items that can be free cycled and upcycled. They need neighborhood centers to learn about circular economy best practices. Citizens want to participate and the city, and the city needs to make it easy for them to do so. To achieve zero waste goals, we also need to expand the capacity of the New York State Bottle Bill, a great example of EPR. The bill is currently responsible for a 70% diversion rate or higher for single-use deposit mark containers. Is this because every New Yorker redeems their cans and bottles to get their nickel back? No, they don't. It's not convenient to carry their cans and bottles back to the grocery store and stand in line outside to use a reverse vending machine. But for poor New Yorkers, redeeming bottles and cans can be a lifesaver. Those who do this work, canners, expand the capacity of this system. They hold producers like Coca-Cola and Budweiser accountable like we all should be doing. Their work benefits New York City while also providing vital income. Council Member Danny Drum, I wanna thank you as well as Council Members Antonio Reynoso, Carlina Rivera, Diana Ayala, Jimmy Van Bramer, Kevin Riley, and Helen Rosenthal for your support for public funding, for Sure We Can, and for our vision of community nonprofit redemption and sustainability centers. We make bottle redemption easy and convenient for canners and non-canners alike. And every day we reinforce the message that recycling, reuse, and repair are dignified activities that everyone can participate in to protect our shared environment. We fully support and want to be a partner to make the zero waste by 2030 plan a reality. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank you. Next up is Phoebe Flaherty, followed by Christine Dietz Romero, followed by Justin Green. The time begins. Hi, good afternoon, and thanks for the opportunity to testify. My name is Phoebe Flaherty. I'm an organizer at Align and we coordinate the Transform Don't Trash Coalition and Climate Works for All Coalition, both of which are dedicated to creating bold climate policies and a just transition for workers. Moving towards our city's zero waste goals is critical to not only reducing New York's carbon emissions, but also to creating good green jobs throughout New York City. The implementation of commercial waste zones is an example of this. The program will reduce New York's GHG emissions, reducing truck miles and increasing recycling and organics collection, and will create good green jobs by increasing worker standards and safety we must fully fund and implement this climate safety and green jobs program. Zero waste policies such as mandatory recyc organics recycling, expanding recycling participation, expanding community drop-off sites, supporting micro haulers and more being heard here today can have a similar impact of reducing our city's overall emissions while also spurring the creation of good green jobs. Throughout the process of moving us towards these goals, we must prioritize labor standards and investments in underemployed New York City communities. At a time when New York's BIPOC communities have been devastated by COVID and the ensuing unemployment epidemic, creating good green union jobs must be a priority of the city. We have an opportunity now to address climate change and put New Yorkers back to work. Let's move towards a just transitional and an equitable recovery for New York City. Thanks so much for your time and the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Next up is Christine Dates Romero, followed by Justin Green, followed by Dior St. Hilaire. Time begins. <clears throat> Clock is ready. You might have to accept the on mute. Okay, we will right now, we'll come back to Christine, but we'll move on to um, Justin Green for now. Justin? Hey. Um... <clears throat> Thank you to City Council for holding this hearing. Um, I'm Justin Green. I'm the Executive Director of Big Reuse, an environmental nonprofit focused on waste reduction, fighting climate change, and creating green jobs. Um, I want to especially thank uh, 
Council Member uh, Reynoso for being such an innovative and exciting progressive leader of the uh, Sanitation Committee. There were so many amazing strides during his leadership. Um, I also want to thank Department of Sanitation for their continued support of community composting. These innovative projects have been nationally recognized. Um, and we just recently actually won U.S. Composter of the Year Award for our site in Queens um, that has been in close partnership with the Department of Sanitation and Parks. Um, you know, I, as someone who's been working in waste reduction and composting for the last 15 years, I really want to strongly advocate that we strive for uh, zero waste by 2030. I mean, it's uh, going to be a reach, but we have to with the uh, increasing uh, impacts in climate change. Um, we have to strive to, for, for a far goal. We can't be reasonable right now. The effects of climate change are not going to be reasonable. So we can't moderate and, and try to do what we, you know, what's easy. We have to really strive and change the systems of overconsumption and uh, waste that have driven us to this point. Um, Big Reuse currently is doing what we can. We pick up from 40 food scrap drop-offs and growing throughout Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. We run two community composting sites that compost over 2 million pounds of residential and parks organic waste and give that compost over 300 community groups to green New York City. Um, we support uh, the zero waste uh, policy. We support the um, 2250 for reporting on zero waste progress and uh, 2103 for diverting uh, reusable food waste. Um, the city, we also support um, the implementation of Save As You Throw to fund these zero waste initiatives. That's a crucial first step to both reducing um, waste and increasing composting and recycling. We would like to see the uh, immediate cessation of incineration of New York City trash. Um, this is totally unacceptable to uh, burden other communities with our toxic uh, incineration waste. Um, and then specifically for our operations, you know, while we are, us and Lower East Side and Earth Matter are one of the primary composters for the whole city right now, and we all are being pushed off our sites um, during this, this period when we are the primary composters. So we're asking the city again to extend our licenses for it at our Queensbridge site um, to look at Lower East Side Ecology Center site and, and build them into the East River Resiliency Plan and to work with Earth Matter on Governor's Island. We also support the uh, $14 million request to support composting for next year in uh, fiscal 22. Thanks so much for your time and support for these projects. Thank you. Next up is Dior St. Hilaire, followed by Jean Selden, followed by Oliver Wright. Box ready. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Good afternoon. My name is Dior St. Hilaire, and I am the founder of Green Feet, a Bronx-based educational consulting firm using hip hop and environmental sustainability to create culturally responsive content that supports curriculum development and engagement. As a worker-owned cooperative through Green Feet Organics, we adopt the principles of environmental justice, waste equity, and a circular economy. Our model is designed to collect and process organic waste locally. It takes the investment of city and state agencies, private entities, residents, schools, community-based organizations, and institutions in order to truly achieve zero waste. In order to get zero waste, we must have a circular economy in place that supports renewable growth and not simply linear. This issue is more complex than recycling correctly or diverting organics, although those are tangible things that will move us in the right direction. We are facing, uh, what we're facing is a disposable culture in society that treats waste like someone else's problem when it is truly the responsibility of both producers and consumers alike. The consciousness that is necessary to develop around consuming less will be inspired through a heavy investment in education, as well as legislation that holds producers to a more sustainable standard of production. It is through Greenfield Organics that we were able to maintain momentum for diverting organic waste when the city decided to cut the budget last year. This has to be valued by the city as necessary and a vital part to achieving zero waste goals. We have a unique opportunity to continue to position ourselves as influence in the world. However, by disrupting the consistency in organics collection, we send a global message that this is not important to the livelihood of our residents. Access to clean air, a clean environment, meaningful and safe jobs, amongst a host of other things. 
As a micro hole in New York City, I find it immensely important that the city prioritizes support of local processing capacity through the use of city owned land, which can lead to more green jobs, less truck traffic, and ultimately less export of our waste, allowing us to reinvest our export dollars back into our city, further contributing to a circular economy. Choosing a cooperative model ensures that as residents who live and work in the same neighborhoods, we are able to lead and control how the decisions that affect us are made. The fact is, if we don't strive towards zero waste, we will continue to participate in targeting poor environmental justice communities to pass waste through transfer stations. The networks are here and we must honor the relationships, the innovators, the creatives who have already started the work while figuring out how to grow and allow access for others to get involved. We believe that by expanding the planning process to include a perspective of worker-owned cooperatives. Intro 2250, 2103, 844 mm -hmm. can accomplish a larger vision of a more equitable waste system that considers the perspective of a population that is invested in truly what happens at a local level. So it wouldn't be green if I didn't leave you with a little hip hop rhyme. So what is a zero waste goal if we can't even see the importance of processing locally? 2030 is like in nine years and with nine million people, the vision is clear. Intro 844 sets a goal. Intro 2250 paves the road and 2103 does a few things. These the hungry saves food and limits composting because the truth is wasted food is wasted energy. Compost is the last solution if there's people to feed. But to truly make this real, we have to pass right over time and collectively build. Thank you for your time and have a wonderful rest of the hearing. I'm here and I'm present. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Next up will be Jane Selden, followed by Oliver Wright, followed by Walter Dogan. Talks ready. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Chair Reynoso and the Committee on Sanitation uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Jane Selden, and I'm here representing 350 NYC, which is a member of the Save Our Compost Coalition and of Climate Works for All. As an environmental group, we recognize the vital role waste, re waste reduction plays in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. While New Yorkers have the potential to recycle 68% of their trash, the current recycling rate is a mere 18%. This means that most of the 12,000 tons of daily residential trash ends up in landfills, which emit methane, a greenhouse gas 30 times more powerful than CO2, or it ends up in incinerators which produce CO2 and toxins like dioxin, nitrous oxide, and lead. Landfills and incinerators are generally located in low-income communities and communities of color whose residents suffer from a range of adverse health problems. The de Blasio administration's 2015 Zero Waste to Landfill by 30 plan cites expansion of organics collection as, as its number one priority. Yet even before the pandemic, the city's residential organics collection rate was a little over 1%. And this past year, we have seen cancellation of curbside recycling, draconian funding cuts to community-based composting pro and community based composting programs. This means that even more waste is being transferred, is being trucked to the city's transfer waste stations, which like landfills and incinerators are located in environmental justice community, communities where residents are already subjected to unhealthy levels of air pollution. And to make matters worse, the parks department uh, announced that they plan to evict Big Reuse and the Lower East Side Ecology Center from their much needed composting sites. These are clearly not the actions of an administration that is truly committed to prioritizing organics waste recycling. What we need is more than just a pledge. We need laws that will ensure steady progress towards making zero waste goals a reality, regardless of the administration currently in power. That's why we support intros 844 and 2250, which is established zero waste as a law and provide a roadmap for achieving it. We, will, we also support 2103, a bill that will not only divert food store waste from landfill, but will serve the needs of the over 1.5 million New Yorkers, including one in four children who currently suffer from food insecurity. Finally, we would like to thank the City Council for supporting the Climate Works for All's request for $3 million for implementing the commercial waste zone laws and $14.8 million for composting for the 
fiscal year 2022 budget. This funding will not only create good green jobs at a time of soaring unemployment, especially in low-income communities, but will move us further along the path to mandatory citywide organics recycling. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Oliver Wright, followed by Walter Dogan, followed by Joel Berg. Clock is ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso and members of the Sanitation Committee. I'm pleased to provide this testimony on behalf of the Solid Waste Advisory Boards of Brooklyn, Queens and the Bronx. We welcome a review of the city's progress towards zero waste. Um, in light of the continuing pressures caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, we believe that now is an ideal time to make a comprehensive case for zero waste, including its financial, environmental and social benefits. The zero by 30 goal was introduced in 2015 and DSNY subsequently produced a strategic plan in 2016. Both of these set numerous policy and program aims, but they stopped short of setting definitive quantitative goals and timetables for their pursuit. The city's current solid waste management plan is also due to expire in 2026. Drafting of the next one typically begins several years in advance, i.e. in a couple of years time. This new solid waste management plan must focus on reduction of waste to landfill and incineration, including prevention, reuse and recycling. It therefore makes sense for the zero by 30 review to feed directly into this work. As such, we urge the DSNY to extend and expand the planning process outlined in intro 2250 and to go beyond devising an extended menu of initiatives and instead create a plan towards zero waste where every initiative has a deadline and a quantifiable goal. This plan should be thoroughly budgeted, both to make the case that moving towards zero waste is financially beneficial for the city and also to enable long range planning. It should be equitable with a strong focus on environmental justice, as several of our colleagues have already eloquently expressed. And it should go beyond the traditional purview of DSNY, for example, by including the Parks Department and the Department of Environmental Protection in the management of organic waste. Two essential elements are worth highlighting. The first is to ensure integration of various planning processes that are already underway, such as the ongoing work of the state's Climate Action Council and implementation of commercial waste zones. The second element is ensuring that the process is expertly advised and includes a deep commitment to stakeholder engagement. Other cities such as Boston and Austin have zero waste plans that benefited from multi-year stakeholder engagement processes, and we need to ensure that DSNY is properly resourced to do something similar. In addition to the ongoing work of the borough-based solid waste advisory boards, now would also be an opportune time to reconstruct the citywide, uh, uh, sorry, citywide recycling advisory board or CRAB, which was mandated under local law 19 of 1989 as a means of ensuring ongoing public engagement. In summary, we believe that planning for zero waste should be a higher priority than constructing a list of actions to be taken at this stage. Thank you for your consideration and time. Thank you. Next is Walter Dogan, followed by Joel Berg, followed by Matt Goes. Clock's ready. You may have to accept the on mute. And I just want to thank uh, Oliver for testifying on behalf of the swabs. Very happy to see the swabs out and about and very active. Thank you so much for the work you're doing, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. The Chairman Reynoso and all of the other esteemed members of this committee. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. My name is Walter Dogan. I'm the president of Brinkerhoff Action Association a community organization in Southeast Queens. I'm in the area of Community Board 12 and within a half mile radius of two waste transfer station that resides on Douglas Avenue and Liberty Avenue. I'm here by today representing Addisley Park Civics, St. Albans Civics, Greater Triangle Civics. We're asking 
to please pay attention to the legislature, legislation being passed. The Department of Sanitation, we're asking the Department of Sanitation to report on the city's progress toward sending zero waste to landfills. Local Law 152, the waste equity law that passed in August 2018 were the beginning steps of this initiative as the legislation meant a reduction in the permitted capacity waste allowed at facilities in districts that were deemed overburdened, such as my community, Southeast Queens Community Board 12. Although the law meant the re a reduction of the protruable waste by 33%. In actuality, it was reduced by about 9%. The data, the transporting was about 1,737 tons per day on average in 2019. The, the post local law 152 capacity has been reduced to 1581. Our community welcomes the reduction and even more welcome the cap that would not be allowed that would not allow an increase in this waste. Although the waste equity bill has passed and now the commercial waste zone bill has passed, there's still a need to improve the operation of the existing transfer facility that exists in the residential area M1 zone. The operator of those facilities must better manage the leche generation, dust control, and elimination of noxious fumes that emanates from the facility because the facility is not fully enclosed. We were recently informed that there are plans to demolish the existing buildings and to replace and build three new waste management and recycling facilities. While we welcome the news of new facilities, we are concerned that the cap that was placed due to the waste bills will be compromised and possibly lifted. The purpose of Local Law 152 was to reduce the amount of waste coming into our old bird environmental justice community. And that needs to remain and increase any increase in allowed capacity beside being a hazardous hazard and a burden to nearby residents will be contradiction to the goal of zero waste to landfill. Thank you for your opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Joel Berg, followed by Matt Gove, followed by Claire Mifflin. Clock is Hello. Ready. Hello, I'm Joel Berg, CEO of Hunger Free America. First, let me say, as a lifelong environmental activist and as a citizen of the city of New York, I'm thrilled that the city council is placing so much emphasis on waste reduction. It's very, very important for the environment. I am unfortunately chagrined to have to state that as an anti-hunger advocate and expert and food waste expert, uh, intro 2103 isn't as well designed as it should be. I don't think we'll really achieve its uh, intended goals, would do very little, if anything, to reduce hunger in America, and I do think would be an undue burden on, on the food industry. Let me explain. Uh, I was the chief federal official in the 1990s at the U.S. Department of Agriculture in charge of reducing food waste for the entire uh, federal government. And I work with the EPA to develop a food waste reduction hierarchy that said in perfect world, if uh, food is good enough to feed to humans, feed it to humans. If it's good enough to feed, if it's not good enough to feed to humans, feed it to animals. If you can't feed it to animals, compost it. And only as a very last resort should it go in the solid waste stream. And it is a, a great shame and scandal that food is still the largest single component of the solid waste stream in New York and in most parts of the United States. So reducing food waste is an important thing, will uh, help the environment greatly since we have such carbon usage to transport this waste states away, but would do very little to reduce hunger in, in New York City. First, it's important to understand that it's often cheaper for a charity to buy food than to travel to pick up donated food. Let me repeat that. It's cheaper to buy food than often to pick up donated food. Before the crisis, City Harvest had a minimum 
of a hundred pound pickup since the crisis. It's moved to mostly picking up pallets. I greatly respect my environmental colleagues on the call, but I don't think it's a coincidence. I don't believe there's a single hunger group in the city uh, who's advocating on behalf of this bill because the way it's structured doesn't make sense. Uh, the food that stores do have to donate is usually uh, one that has a, a very that's limited shelf life. And so posting once a month would not be workable. And as much as I disagree often with the burdens claimed by the supermarket industry, particularly their opposition to the minimum wage increases, I think, you know, uh, and as much as I disagree with their claim, this bill is unconstitutional, basic claim it doesn't make sense to put the burden on the supermarket industry to sort of force nonprofit groups to take the pickups. The larger groups won't take the pickups because it's not big enough. The smaller groups don't have the resources to take uh, the, the pickups, and it would have to be far more frequently than once a month. If you do want to do this, I would say make a minimum of at least uh, 100 or 200 pounds. And if uh, people are going to claim it's unconstitutional on the speech side to mandate they post it, then you can just tax or, or have uh, you know, uh, carting fees for the food that's wasted. But the way it's designed now is not going to be that helpful. I'd love to work with council members and staff to figure out a way that would be more helpful and to also support SNAP and WIC outreach, which will have far bigger uh, uh, impact on reducing hunger in New York City. And I continue to thank the council for your leadership on environment and hunger. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Matt Gov, followed by Claire Mifflin, followed by Kathy Nazari. Box ready. Hey, y'all. Uh, thanks for sticking around. My name is Matt Gov. I work for Surfrider Foundation. Surfrider has chapters all over the country of volunteers, uh, including a chapter right here in New York City. The chapters work to protect our ocean and coasts uh, for all to use. Uh, today, I'm mostly speaking, though, from the Reusable NYC Coalition. Reusable NYC is a coalition of 34 nonprofits and community organizations united to eliminate needless waste and pollution created by single-use foodware. Uh, talking about clamshells, straws, and more. Uh, many of our organizations were previously united to pass uh, the bag law legislation uh, years ago under the banner of Bag It NYC. So. We've gotten the band back together and we're, we're working on some new laws. We, uh, we thank you for supporting the bills being heard today. It's really great to highlight uh, really the dire need for action. To our environment and, and disproportionately polluting communities of color. Uh, we didn't have time to to officially review the bills being heard today. That takes that takes quite a bit of doing, but we do support the concepts and applaud the council for highlighting the important goal of reducing waste in New York City. Uh, we are, however, officially supporting uh, INT uh, 0936, the Straws by Request Bill, by uh, sponsored by Council Member Rosenthal and INT 1775B, sponsored by Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer. 1775B, also known as the Skip the Stuff Bill, would require restaurants and food delivery apps and online delivery platforms to provide uh, what we're calling the stuff, single use utensils, condiments, napkins, uh, only, require, uh, only put those into the bag for uh, food delivery if the customer requests those things. It's a, it's a simple law that saves restaurants money and reduces unnecessary waste. Both of those bills are in the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, and uh, we ask that those bills move forward. So um, thanks for letting us speak today. Reusable NYC Coalition uh, is, is ready to work with council members to move these bills forward. Please contact me um, at M for Matt. My last name, Gove, G-O-V-E, at surfrider.org. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Claire Mifflin, followed by Kathy Mazzari, followed by Anna Sack. Clock is ready. Hello, I'm Claire Mifflin, founder of the Center for Zero Waste Design and part of the Save Our Compost Advocacy Group. Achieving zero waste in a high-density city requires a comprehensive plan with space des designed into the urban realm, including parks, to 
collect, process and circulate materials for beneficial reuse. Policies, infrastructure and education are all essential, but without designing the city for effective logistics, they will not be successful or equitable. For example, say organics collection becomes mandatory citywide. A 250 unit multifamily building would need at least 50 of the organic brown bins. In a typical building setup, a resident puts trash into a chute which feeds directly into a compactor and bags reducing space and labor. You can't put a small brown bin at the bottom of a chute. They work for small quantities or for a luxury building with sufficient space and ventilated waste rooms and enough staff to set out 50 bins on the sidewalk, bring them back in, wash them, return them to the waste rooms. But most buildings don't have enough space or labor for that. The city needs to pilot alternative systems. Equipment in large buildings could convert food waste to organic fertilizer, reducing volume and weight by up to 90%. Other pilots could serve neighborhoods like Chinatown, full of walk-up apartments and ground floor retail, where there is little or no space for waste. Containers in the street or open spaces should be piloted so organic waste can be easily dropped off. These could be serviced by local micro haulers and composted in parks and green spaces citywide to regenerate soils and increase the city's resilience. It would also improve sidewalks, reduce rats, create green jobs and support urban agriculture. We're grateful that for the council's support for Save Our Compost budget request, which includes these pilots throughout neighborhoods within the city alongside other critical initiatives. Also, we support the zero waste bills introduced today for a plan by 2030 and milestones to get there. The zero waste design guidelines were developed through a collaborative effort with many city agencies in the Center for Architecture. They illustrate many design strategies to reduce waste from CND waste to providing dishwashers and food donation refrigerators and food service spaces to bottle fillers in public spaces to collection strategies which would clear our sidewalks from trash bags and rats. The Center for Zero Waste Design stands ready to help the city in convening a task force of multiple city agencies, building managers, architects and designers to pilot and implement these strategies citywide as part of a larger zero waste plan, which is essential to ensure every resident, student, business, porter and reuse worker can successfully help the city reach zero waste by 2030. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Kathy Nazari, followed by Anna Sachs, followed by Christine Dave Romero. Talk is ready. Thanks, Nicole. Good afternoon, Chairman Renoso and members of the Sanitation Committee. I'm Kathy Nazari of the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. We commend you for your hard work and urge you to pass on pros 844, 2250 and 2103 as important first steps in getting New York's zero waste by 2030 goal on track as we emerge from the pandemic. Zero waste must mean zero waste to landfill and incineration or we are trading one environmental problem for another. New York recycles just 18% of its waste. Another 18% is recyclable, wrongly sent to landfill or incinerators Compostable food scraps comprise yet another 33.6%. All told, this is nearly 70% of all city residential waste. An additional unknown amount of discarded materials curbside could be reused if collected. Diverting and donating, it is necessary to eventually achieve zero waste. Waste prevention and reuse have been at the top of the EPA solid waste hierarchy, but never supported here. New York City must legislate reduction in the production and consumption of single use and other hard to dispose of products and packaging, especially plastic. Successful programs in other cities must be replicated locally. We paid more than $420 million to bury and burn waste last year, generating pollution and environmental degradation, feeding the climate crisis. Recycling and reuse programs and mandatory curbside organics can generate income, jobs, and other societal benefits. They must be legislated now. Zero waste intersects with environmental justice issues that are part of the work to build an equitable society. 
EJ communities have suffered the most from destructive waste management policies exemplified by the more than 70% of our truck transfer stations located in just four communities of color. EJ must be embedded into every waste decision with these communities having full participation in decision making going forward. NYCHA, home to over 600,000 New Yorkers, has a recycling rate of just 1.5%. Innovation, fully involving residents, and adequate funding are all crucial to address this. An ongoing multi-pronged motivational citywide zero waste public education campaign in the media, public spaces, transit stations, workplaces, and apartment buildings would help New Yorkers who are confused about what and how to recycle. Uh, reduce, reuse, recycle, and compost. NYC's 1.1 million school children are powerful influences to their peers and families. It is critical to expand the school organics collection to all 1,800 DOE schools by the next school year. Enforcement needs adequate funding and intelligent implementation, or zero waste will not succeed here. Time expired. I just, I'll just finish up. NYC must design a zero waste environment through education and incentives for architects, developers, building managers, and city planners using the zero waste design guidelines. MSWAB is, has submitted written testimony with specifics about how all of this can be achieved. We look forward to working with you on these goals and thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up is Anna Sachs followed by Christine Diaz Romero. Clock is ready. Can you hear me? We hear you. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Anna Sachs. I am a member of the Save Our Compost Coalition. I work at Think Zero, which is a waste reduction and diversion consulting firm. And I do my own thing also as the trash walker where I go through waste. These are different suggestions that I have um, for how we can structure waste in New York City. On the residential side, I think we need to right size our collection dates. So according to the DSMY study from 2017, a third of our waste consists of organics, a third consists of recyclables, and then a third is this other. 6% of the other is textiles, actually. So why is it that on the Upper West Side, I have three days of trash collection and one day of recycling collection? When a third of our waste is organics, a third recyclable, and a third is trash, quote unquote, um, even though a lot of it isn't. Why don't we right size our collection days to match the different waste streams? And naturally then people um, will separate because they don't wanna be holding on to trash if it's only being collected once a week. Um, for NYCHA, we, as we mentioned, it's a city within a city. It's the size of Atlanta. It doesn't have recycling. There's no recycling going on at NYCHA, very, very little. Some of it led by Bridget, who we heard from earlier. Um, they don't have bins, recycling bins. If they do have recycling bins, please take a look at them. They're all lined with black trash liners. What does that mean? If a NYCHA resident correctly re places cardboard paper into a bin, it's not going to be recycled. It's set out in a black trash bag and it's collected with the trash. Look at on the collection days, uh, the residential recycling streams, in front of any NYCHA development, any NYCHA um, housing, it's all trash. That needs to change. And that starts with just having the infrastructure, having letting residents have opportunity to recycle. Um, right now we have an epidemic of empty storefronts. And I think that's a great opportunity to create permanent swap spots, repair spots, community hubs, um, places where you know innovation can really take place and community can build. Um, I think also we we toss as a city, both corporates, corporations and residents, toss a lot of usable items. And I would love to see for areas that DSNY controls the waste, taking control of the usable items and finding value in it. So that could be collecting furniture, um, bringing it somewhere that could be partnering with people who would gladly like resell it. There are different ways to do that, but um, mostly the furniture currently left out of the curb. It's late at night and then the, the truck comes and picks it up and there isn't a lot of time for people to get it. So I would love to see innovation there. Um, for schools, we right now, if you're get, going to school, you get like a salt and pepper packet, a ketchup packet, a mustard packet, a jam packet, all these butter, like all these single use individual condiments. There's really opportunity to switch to bulk condiments and that would save waste and money. Um, we should switch to milk fountains instead of cartons for WWF did a study and it, you save six times as much um, milk because with the carton, there's so much milk waste per student. So you'll be wasting um, 
six times less by switching to fountains. Um, I would love to see promoting sharing tables at school. Right now, there's a lot of confusion at schools. I've spoken to teachers and principals there. Um, they don't know if they can allow students to take home the food that they didn't eat. They don't know if they can donate it. Um, a lot, clarify that and promote sharing schools. Um, I've also heard about pouring bleach onto food, edible food at schools that to make sure no one can use it. That practice needs to stop. Um, com community composting needs to be allowed in the park and it needs to stay there. Um, I, I just have two more quick points. One is enforcing the plastic bag ban. If you go to D'Agostino, any D'Agostino, well, I'll be specific, the one on the upper side, only plastic bags that it's using. And this is over a year after the plastic bag ban. Um, and also enforce commercial composting. Please speak with the commercial haulers. None of them are sending, or very few, very few are sending actually composting trucks out. Please get them to commit, you know, this is part of their contract, this is part of their job, have send out those co the commercial composting trucks. Um, I have more ideas, but this, this, is, this will do. Thanks. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Christine Dietz Romero. Lock is ready. Uh, my name is Christina Dutz Romero, and I'm from the Lower East Side Ecology Center. And I would like to thank uh, Chairperson Reynoso for holding this uh, very important um, hearing on the eve of Earth Day. Of course, uh, a lot of people testifying today, Earth Day for us is every day. Um, so thank you again for holding this hearing and I'm testifying um, on behalf of the Lower East Side Ecology Center and in support of intro 844, um, intro 2050, 2250 and also uh, intro 2103. Uh, we really have to stop to pretend that waste goes away just because that pile of trash uh, that we leave on our curbside is, disappears magically in the morning. It goes to landfills and incinerators and our current waste infrastructure disproportionately inflicts environmental burdens on black and brown communities. Recommitting to the goals of zero waste by 2030 to landfills or incinerators will allow us to turn this liability and environmental injustice into responsible management of natural resources and generate green jobs. Organic waste makes up 40% of our waste stream and we need to develop local processing capacity but beyond our existing waste uh, water transfer uh, treatment plants to produce soil amendment that is sorely needed in our city to regenerate our soils. Additionally, we need to ensure that community-based composting programs will continue to operate on city-owned land, including in parks. I also want to briefly talk about our electronic waste recycling uh, program that we ran successfully for over 18 years. Uh, it's impossible to run a, a program like this in a high rent um, market like New York City without support from, uh, from the government. And we had a very uh, successful program. We diverted over a million pounds of uh, electronics out of the waste stream each year and found very creative ways of also reusing some of this material. And uh, unfortunately, um, in the Guanas area, redevelopment happened. A developer bought our site and didn't renew our lease. And uh, the economics of renting something right now for this program was just not there. And I would really like to call on the city to also provide space for programs like this so they can happen here in the city. They are. Um, they're impressed by the community. They provide a lot of added on value. They are educational and they need to happen to reach our goals. Thank you so much. Thank you. I see one hand raised, but if we had inadvertently missed anyone else who had registered to testify and has yet to be called, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called in the order that your hand has been raised. So next we'll hear from Meredith Danberg Vicarelli. Mark is ready. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Meredith Danberg Ficarelli, and I am the director of Common Ground Compost LLC, a member of the Save Our Compost Coalition, a member of the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board, and a board member of the U.S. Composting Council. Through my work, I build zero waste programs, advocate for the expansion of access to waste reduction services, and center education on materials literacy the power of individual behavioral change, 
and the recognition that all people must demand structural change in order to build a livable and just future for all. We support a citywide zero waste policy from the perspective that NYC has an opportunity to live the example that it claims to set. Most New Yorkers did not participate in voluntary waste diversion programs when they existed. 2020's global reset and the forced restructuring of our budgets must be leveraged to build a new strategy. Climate resilient infrastructure requires significant upfront investment to provide long-term services and benefits. Waste infrastructure alongside our energy grid and water supply must be reimagined and all levels of government must recognize that now is the time to find the funds to build what our future needs. We cannot wait. Local waste diversion will save money over time compared to landfill and incineration costs, but simple economics must not be the only variable in this equation. Waste infrastructure disproportionately harms chronically disenfranchised communities, and we must fund and build while dismantling that harm. Waste diversion programs and education should be at the core of the city's zero waste strategy. To get there, we must identify and analyze all costs associated with current waste management operations, including institutional, residential, and commercial systems, and identify alternative uses for what is likely more than a billion dollars a year only in waste export costs. I wanna thank all the zero waste advocates, experts, students, supportive elected and appointed officials and trash enthusiasts who are building momentum and continuing to fight for waste diversion. Our future depends on all of us holding our representatives to the task of letting us build the economy that we wanna see and your voices matter. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, seeing no other hands raised, Chair, I'll turn it back over to you for any closing remarks. I just wanna thank um, everybody that's testified today. Um, if the administration had the same commitment and rigor that the folks on, um, on the Zoom have, uh, we would have been far and above and probably early on our way to zero waste by 2030. Um, I also want to thank the young people that took time out of their day from school or from wherever they are to come to this uh, long hearing to testify. I think um, showing what the future looks like might also motivate the administration to know that it's inevitable that we will reach zero waste, um, whether or not they're, they think it's gonna happen on their timeline. Um, and this might, might be the last time we talk about zero waste in my tenure as chair of sanitation, possibly. Uh, and I just wanna say, I thank you all for like all the work that we've done um, in, in this fight together for trash um, over the last seven and a half years. I do wanna thank the DSNY um, I want to say that if you ever met any of these folks in the Department of Sanitation on policy and things like that, that it's a, it's remark it, it, their, their commitment is remarkable. I'm not saying we're not having any more hearings. I'm just saying um, forcing their hand outside of a vote, which could be the next hearing, a vote for these bills would be the next time we talk about zero waste. We got a lot more work to do on other things and ensuring that we have the commercial waste zones actually up and running is going to be very important. We have budget hearings coming up over the next couple of months. We have a lot of priorities to, to get to, but um, I want to thank you all uh, for being here with me. And uh, with that, I, this meeting is adjourned.